Hello, and we are live. Welcome to the bloodstream. Am I coming through loud and clear? Let's see. Yes, I am coming through loud and clear. A couple of things I want to touch upon tonight before I bring my special guest on. If you guys have questions for um, Patrick, we're going to try and do a Q&A toward the end of the show, time permitting, of course. So hold all those questions until the end of the show or feel free to send them via a super chat that supports the channel and YouTube keeps a log of those so I can refer to them very easily. I'm also going to make the link available. Um, so if you want to actually jump onto the stream and ask Patrick a question face to face, digitally face to face, um, I'm making that link available first to my patrons and my channel members, and then I'll throw it out to, it'll be a free for all at that point. So, um, so yes, without further ado, I am very, very, very happy to be joined tonight by a writer, a producer, a director, an editor, and just an all around super cool guy. I'm talking about Mr. Patrick Lucier. How you doing, sir? Great, Justin. Nice to, uh, nice to see you. It's, it's a pleasure to have you on, man. I've been a fan of yours for, uh, for quite a while. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Now, uh, uh, Todd Farmer sings your praises and, uh, recommended I, uh, I, uh, come join you. So I was excited when you, uh, made the invitation. Well, I shout out to Todd. He's in the chat right now. And, uh, so thank you for helping. <laughs> thank you for helping to facilitate this Todd. Um, just between you and I, Patrick, I don't know how you deal with that guy. I don't know how you work with him. Such a diva. <sighs> Well, you know, yeah, I'm just glad he's he's grown out of the the uh, having to be naked part of his career, so, uh, uh, <laughs> which we all do eventually. That was a that was a rocky road. That was a rocky road, but um, hopefully we're out of it. I don't know. We'll see. You know, we'll see. Not over yet. <laughs> he may relapse into it. You never know. Yeah, you, you, know never, you never know. Things happen. <laughs> Well, we've got a lot to discuss here. Um, you've done a lot in, you know, you've, you've, you've done a lot and you, there's still a lot more to do. So without further ado, let's go ahead and dive right in. Todd says he hates me now. <laughs> so. You might mean me. No, he says I hate Pizza. He specifically pointed me out. <laughs> oh, but, uh, that's, that's nice. <laughs> uh, well, let's, let's go back to the beginning. Let's start at the beginning. Hmm. A young Patrick Lucier hanging out in Canada. Um, when did you first decide that show business was something that you wanted to pursue professionally? Uh, I guess it was really in you know back when Star Wars came out, when when there was all the stuff on on the making of Star Wars, where you actually understood that there was a job uh, that you could actually get involved in making movies so it's just like yeah you know wow oh, they're not just made by elves um so that i i thought was uh something to pursue being up up in canada it's always like well i don't quite know how to go about it at the time there wasn't a lot of film stuff happening up in vancouver but uh certainly that's changed over the years um but you know it's uh my father used to always say if you want something bad enough you'll get it you just have to want it and uh, so it was just, you know, wanting it and finding the opportunities and, and doing a lot of stuff for free and, and uh, you know, never underestimate the power of volunteering <laughs> um, there you go. to get your foot in the door. Everybody's got one or two movies that had a real impact on their mm. lives. Um, was there a particular movie or movies that made you say, that's what I want to do? Yeah, I mean, certainly Star Wars is one. Um, uh, weirdly enough, uh, uh, as a kid before that, I was, I was incredibly obsessed with Planet of the Apes, mm -hmm. uh, the original Planet of the Apes, and and beneath the Planet of the Apes in particular, uh, I remember see the first time I saw that was it was on the midnight movie, and I had an old black and white TV that was uh, borrowed and was in my room and and getting up in the night and 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 you know sometime after midnight uh finally waking up realized i need to play the apes on turning it on 
And it was the mo- it was the scene where I reveal my inmost self unto my God, and they all rip their faces off. And and so it was like, there's no apes in this scene. <laughs> um, and, and it was horrific, and that that probably shaped my uh, life ever after um, of wanting to get in both not just movies, but you know, gravitating towards the genre and things like that um, because of that moment. Were your folks supportive of you wanting to get into the business? The, the business, sure. My my um, you know my my father always wanted to be a DJ. Um, he wasn't a DJ, but he, he would, he would DJ like, you know, the, the, the high school dances and stuff like that. I mean, cause he had the biggest record collection cause he had a paper route and he would buy, he would buy records. Um, so that was always his passion. He ended up, you know, he, he was discouraged from a life in the arts by, by his parents. Mm. So he, uh, did not do that. Um, although when he was 45, he took up the trombone and joined a band and it's he's in his 80s now and he's played in multiple bands uh, the whole second half of his life um but when i said i wanted to get into the into the film industry he was completely encouraging he even had you know his old radio textbooks and he's just like i don't know if these will be you know of any use to you but i kept i kept these and, and uh, uh so he was he was very encouraging my mother was an artist and and, and she was uh, you know, they were, uh, they were both very encouraging of the strange pursuit. That's very, that's very cool. And and that proves to you, you know, you, it's never too late to learn something new, pick up an instrument no, or you know. it, it never is. You know, I, I think, uh, people often forget that, you know, I worked for, uh, Wes Craven for a lot of years, but he didn't make his first movie till he was 30. You know, he didn't even get into the, into the, uh film industry until late um by standards of you know today where people you know are getting academy awards when they're 12. Mm. um uh, that's a slight exaggeration um but you know he uh he always wanted to do it so you know i think you can at any point it, especially now and then you've got a way to shoot a movie in your in your hand that you carry around with you all the time you you know, can pretty much do it whatever, whenever you want. Yeah, exactly. Um, a couple of your earliest editing gigs were on the HBO series, the hitcher, which <laughs> I, which <laughs> I loved. The hitchhiker. And, and I, the hitchhiker yeah. I'm sorry. The hitchhiker. Yeah. 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 Which, run amok. which I loved. I can hear the theme song in my head right now. Um, <laughs> Paige Fletcher is the hitchhiker. Oh, I loved it. I loved it. <laughs> um, and, and also MacGyver. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How did you uh, land those gigs and what did you learn about um, editing from those jobs? Uh, I worked for, on, on the hitchhiker. Uh, I volunteered. So I worked for free on a show called Hamilton's quest, a little Canadian show um, uh, that was being done for, I think the CBC and uh, Canadian broadcasting company corporation. Um, and, uh, and that crew, the editor was going, uh, Michael Robeson, who's a TV director now and, uh, uh, was going, we're going on to, um, the hitchhiker and, uh, Michael had worked on the hitchhiker before and he, and they invited me to be the apprentice, uh, editor on the hitchhiker. Um, and the other editor along with Michael Robeson on that was John F. Link. Um, and John cut predator and uh, was one of the editors in predator one of the editors in die hard uh he also got like uh electric glide and blue and and uh had an amazing resume but he um uh he was on hiatus um from predator because they had shot the movie with the creature that didn't work and they had thrown the creature out you know so stan winston could come in and during the hiatus, while they were redesigning the creature, he um, came into the Hitchhiker. It's that season of the Hitchhiker. Um, so I heard all sorts of stories about Predator, like, ah, oh, that monster didn't work. And, oh, they're, they're coming up with a new monster. So, um, <laughs> uh, and then he went back when we finished. He, he went back and finished the movie. Did you, you were telling me an interesting story the other day about um, editing a scene in which a dog... Um, disarms <laughs> a bomb for yeah. in, in MacGyver. How, what? Yeah. So how MacGyver, much, I started. 
I, I started as an assistant editor and then and then went on to editing uh, on MacGyver. Um, and near the end of my time on MacGyver, I, I had a chance to direct some inserts. And MacGyver was so insert, you know, because of the MacGyverisms, so insert specific. There are all these, you know, there'd be three days of just shooting of the little pieces of gack. And and one of the first things I got to direct when I got to do the inserts was was a, a dog, uh, Winston the dog, who was star of uh, Stakeout with Emilio Estevez and uh, Richard Dreyfus and Aiden hmm. Quinn and Madeline So. <laughs> uh, Winston the dog, uh, who had his own credit, uh, disarming a bomb, and and Winston uh, had no interest in disarming bombs. Uh, was totally uh, incapable of disarming bombs. And uh, it took a much longer time to try and make look like uh, the dog had disarmed a bomb when it really had no interest in doing so. Very interesting. So was yeah. it, w w did those gigs kind of prove to you like, okay, so this is, this is, this is, this is for me. This is what I want to do. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love editing. I still love editing. It, it was a great way in, um, I love the fact that you got to see it become a movie, um, you know, whatever, or a TV show or whatever, but you, you got to see everything come together. Um, you know, uh, and it, there was something about putting those puzzles together and, and, and how they flung together the images would work. Uh, I, yeah, I found that to be a very sort of intoxicating experience and, and really enjoyed enjoyed that uh, process and uh, had some great mentors and teachers early on in it and learned a lot very quickly and got to, I was, you know, I was an assistant editor for three years and then, and then got to move up to editing on, on MacGyver on, a, on an episode called uh, Invisible Killer, uh, uh, which was uh, basically a ripoff of Shoot to Kill, that old Tom Berger, uh, Sidney Poitier, uh, Clancy Brown movie. Mm. Um, but it was fun and, and had great complicated scenes to cut and, and it was one of the actors that directed a Danny Elkar. Um and and yeah, just he was thrilled with how it turned out because you know it one of the hard, hardest things to cut is is you know, you have people around a dinner table or whatever. So this they had this had five characters sitting around a campfire and you have all the different coverage and how to make people make sure they're looking at this, you know, look in the right direction and Right. Yeah. Was, uh, you know, uh, yeah, it was, it was a, it was a fun challenge and, and it was incredibly excited by it. Very cool. Uh, in the early nineties, you first worked with Wes Craven on the television series, Nightmare Cafe. Uh, yeah. this of course was the first of many collaborations with, uh, with you and the late Mr. Craven. Um, were you familiar with Wes Craven prior to, uh, getting this? Game? Oh Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I had I had seen uh, the original Nightmare Nightmare on Elm Street uh, opening day. I remember uh, I had worked at a video store back in the beginning, you know, the dawn of VHS, uh, and uh, I had had seen a lot of his old movies, you know, Hills of Eyes, and, and uh, I'm trying to remember the other ones, Deadly Blessing, and and, and Last House on the Left, and and. Uh, yeah, and and different you know, super in the rainbow and, and all sorts of other films of his. So I was definitely a fan of his work. So when the opportunity came up to, to work with him, I, I was very excited to, to have that. And, uh, and he and I just hit it off on the, on the series. Um, even though there's only six episodes. Um, and he was, uh, very, uh, you know, welcoming and said, Hey, uh, I'd love you to cut my next feature. So that was two years later in the middle of it was, was a possibility it would have been village of the dam. He was going to make that at one time, uh, with Linda Hamilton. If she had said, yes, she was, um, circling it, but ultimately decided to pass. And, uh, and then, uh, Wes went on to do Wes Craven's new nightmare, which was the first feature I cut for him. And, and, uh, John Carpenter took over mm -hmm. village of the dam. What were your first impressions of Wes Craven? Were there was there any intimidation? Like, oh, this is the, this is the Freddy Krueger guy. Um, you know, I didn't, I didn't think of it that way. Um, we didn't actually meet 
uh, Wes on the pilot. Uh, Philip Noyce directed the pilot. Richard Francis Bruce was the co-editor on the pilot. Uh, Richard cut, uh, at that time, he had cut Dead Calm and Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome. Since then, he went on to cut like Shawshank Redemption and Air Force One and Seven. And, you know, it's a brilliant editor. I learned a ton from him. Um, uh, and Philip Noyce directing that, you know, Wes was finishing uh, uh, People Under the Stairs during the pilot. So he wasn't available um, to be up uh, in Vancouver where the, where the pilot was shot. And then when they got the order for the five more episodes, he came up and was, you know, because uh, people in the series had finished. Um, so he came up into that. Uh, and that's where we met. So we didn't meet until after we'd already done one of the episodes, which he wrote. So um, it it sort of felt like you already knew, knew him without knowing him. And then meeting him, he's, you know, Wes was uh, always very, sort of quiet and very funny, uh, he's very tall. Um, he feels very uh, professorial. Um, you know, he's an old English teacher. He, 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 he doesn't, whatever you imagine Wes Craven would be like based on his work is not what he's like. <laughs> um, so it, it was, he was just, he was a really witty, funny, smart, very thinky. You know, he would have all sorts of uh, you know, how he would uh, approach things was very contemplative and, and very um, story driven in a classical sense of story because he, he knew so much about storytelling and, and, and the roots of storytelling. So, yeah, it was, I don't know, it was, it wasn't intimidating. It was, he, we just clicked. I, I quote him all the time because I think he's got the best quote about why people love horror. And he said, horror is boot camp for the psyche. And yeah. that's what I, I, I mimic. I, I say that all the time. I always, I give him credit, but I say that's yeah. horror is a boot camp for the psyche. That's why people like yeah. it. Yeah. Well, I think it, it, it is, you know, it's that thing you, that's hopefully worse than what's going on in your life that you survive. Mm. So you can survive something else. Um, and you know, you think about the origin of, of horror stories that go back to the campfire, right? To, to the cavemen sitting around talking about the dark, um, and the, how you cope with the dark. That's how you cope with it, uh, exactly. is telling them the stories of, of the thing in the dark. It's going to get you. Very cool. Well, we'll definitely talk a lot more about Wes Craven in the, the very near future. I'm sure. Um, but you edited a lot of television and a handful of movies early in your career. How different mm -hmm. is the editing process from a television series compared to a feature film? Um, by and large, TV has a lot more close-ups. That's really it. I think that's that's not always the case anymore because you have, you know, widescreen TVs and stuff like that, you know, uh, that becomes less of an issue. The bigger your set is when you're cutting for somebody watching their, their 14 inch tummy TV. Um, that was a one, three, three, uh, cut it, you know, you wanted to get into the, into somebody's yak as fast as possible <laughs> so you can see their face. So you can see MacGyver react and look and go, as we were always told, MacGyver's a man of action, not a man of thought. Don't cut to Very him true. thinking. Very that true. was a, that was a lecture they they would always give us: no thinking, um, <laughs> only doing. Uh, <laughs> and then they would tell us, "We want to cut to him coming up with the idea, but isn't that thinking?" Um, but anyway, yeah, whatever. <laughs> um, either, yeah, uh, but that's the primary difference. You know, certainly, I found where there was a real difference in cutting was cutting for like uh, 185 um, versus cutting for like 235, you know, really widescreen, you know, cutting scream, we, we cutting new nightmare. It's a very fast cut uh, movie. You know, it's a 185. There's, there's uh, the, so the frame is a little wider and uh, rather not square, but um, uh, there's more visual real estate top bottom, uh, uh, so you, uh, it seemed to afford itself to be cut faster, whereas uh, Scream is is cut slower, 
not every scene obviously but but there are different things to, to let you take it in it's, it's you know we uh talked about that i re remember looking at all these widescreen movies and looking at the cutting patterns and, and talking about that with wes and you know trying to trying to make sure that we were paying attention to it because he hadn't done a widescreen movie before that either so that was a that was, that was a big thing uh, anamorphic so it's the yeah, anamorphic lenses and all that other crazy shit that people did <laughs> I did one of these a uh, couple of months ago for the 20th anniversary of Valentine and the editor, Steve Merkovich was part of that stream. And I asked him uh, editing of all the jobs that go into creating a film seems to me as someone from the outside as the most overwhelming, especially when they were shooting film on film and you just have reels mm. of footage and you've got all these different takes and all this different coverage. And you've got to be mindful, like you said, of which way people are looking and of continuity. Is it as overwhelming as it seems? You know, it's, it's, you just do it one scene at a time. You look at all the dailies, you look at all the things I, I would have a, a real sort of, pattern to how i would do it you, you know you watch all the dailies and then um in the beginning i used to have, you have a line script so a line script is is a script that's been marked up so that uh, a straight line meaning this line is on camera a squiggly line means it's it's off camera so you can see from the script supervisor these are the script reports oh. um and funnily enough it was around screen that i stopped using them and, and i haven't used one since um so God, over 20 years um, because I, I find the footage always sort of would tell me where it wanted to go and how it wanted to work. So, um, and uh, so cutting scenes together, I would, you know, it, it was always first and foremost, you cut for performance. What's the best performance? What's the most consistent performance? Cause sometimes, you know, the actors will give you all sorts of different ranges deliberately. Um, so, you know, how are you crafting and threading all those performances together? So cut every single reading of every single line in every single angle together so that you, so that you can then start whittling away and find the best pairs that go together, the best reactions that go together, uh, until you let, until suddenly you have seen, it actually allows you also to cut really quickly. Um, and build a scene. I, I would often get to the end of a scene and have no idea how I got there. Mm. Um, you sort of, you get in this weird sort of Zen place. And, you know, I, I learned very early on from an editor named Mike Elliott, who was an editor on MacGyver, um, who said, you know, you, you, you have to cut with your gut, not your head. And you have to feel everything you cut. If it's a, if it's a sad scene, you have to feel the sadness. If it's an exciting scene, you have to be on the edge of your seat. You know, if it's a traumatic scene, you have to feel the drama. You you have to be the the unseen character in the scene while you cut it, um, you know. And I've I've recut things that other people have cut on different a few different times. You know, been brought in as a different editor, and um, and you can always tell when somebody's you look at a timeline, you know, like on an Abbott or like Perks or whatever, and, then, um, and you can tell somebody by the timeline who is cutting with their head who's trying to second guess themselves and trying to keep all their options open and trying to, as opposed to, you know, just make the decision, just cut it. You can always change it, but cut, cut with your gut, cut with your heart, cut with the, you know, you have to feel it. Don't think it. Um, that may be a longer answer than you want. Oh, that, no, that's, 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 that's um, perfect. Cause I mean, I, editing to me seems like, one of the most important jobs. Cause I mean, how many movies are made in the editing booth? I mean, oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, it, ja yeah. Jaws Here's is a, a, Jaws is a perfect example. Oh. I mean, that's why they yeah. named a whole building on the universal lot after Verna yeah. Fields. She, yeah, she basically sure. saved that movie. So, I mean, yeah. It, yeah. And, 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 and it's certainly, uh, I years ago worked with a producer who said, you know, a DP can make your movie look pretty. An editor can save your movie. Yeah. Um, and it's quite a difference, uh, yeah. and it's, you know, and it's, you, and you, you watch movies where you, you, uh, you know, I remember movies I saw as a kid or whatever that I loved and then saw them years later and go and w understanding what I was watching as opposed to just watching it for the enjoyable experience. And you were saying, it's like, Oh my God, this is this, they totally fabricated this, this doesn't exist this way. And you can see it if you know what to look for. But the first time you watch it, it's just, you know, you're just caught up in the magic of it. Mm -hmm. 
because it's a you know and editing's a real filmmaking skill um you know there's there, there's not a lot of other uh venues that that skill can be used for it's it's very specific to to filmmaking you know how those images go together how moving images uh work to tell a story how you can influence performance how you can shape a performance um how you can you know change an emotional reaction to a character and, and what they do and how they do it that's very much an unique to to editing more so than i think probably almost any other department um is it easier yeah. to edit a film now that most movies are shot on digital uh, you know it um it's technically probably um uh, certainly previewing uh like when we back when we previewed on film that, that was terrifying because you all you wanted was every splice to go through the projector you didn't uh -huh. even care how it played. You just didn't want it to burn. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I saw that in the run through of, of Wes Craven's New Nightmare, one of the splices caught and burned. Mm. And we we had to get a new shot into the into the film uh, before we did the big preview at night. And it was just like oh, racing to the lab to get a reprint as, as opposed to now. It's, you know, you would never have that problem. So, yeah, um, yeah I don't miss any of that shit. That film <laughs> stuff. People people lament the loss of film and oh, you know, the reels and this. It's you know, carrying the film because it's so heavy. It's like, oh man, that that was always a terrifying experience. I'm more than happy to have that part done and and be you know, at the end of the day, it's it's in a it's on a hard drive. Um, uh, it's so much easier. Um, yeah. But editing is is editing, you know. It's it's uh, wherever the however you get the the you know the however it's captured, the flow of images and the storytelling is the same, yeah, and it's the same now as it you know as it was uh, back uh, Phantom of the Opera, uh, uh, you know the old Pon uh, it, It's just about how you how you piece the images together. Very cool. Do you think that coming from the editing background made you a better director or at least a more, I guess, prepared director? Oh God. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, uh, it, uh, I think coming from uh, editing gave you a real sense of what uh, was absolutely essential for storytelling. Uh, and certainly, you know, if you're working on something that's lower budget and you're running out of running out of time, uh, you can do triage in your head really fast of, I have to get out with at least this, this, and this, um, and, and how to, how to amortize getting that stuff as fast as possible, how to turn one shot into three shots and in order to make sure you have those moments you have to have. Yeah. That's uh, that's a real, uh, benefit i found you know, mm. certainly in directing i was always very grateful to have that experience and then also when you know when you're talking to actors about um well this part's going to be you know they're worried well that take wasn't very good well yeah, the parts that needed to be good were great uh and we're going to do you know this part worked here this will work like this this will you know that you can speak in a in a very specific cinematic language of how things will go together as opposed to uh uh you know don't worry about it we'll fix it in post it's just like well this is exactly how it's going to be it's going to go like this it's going to do this it's going to do that and, and i think i think there's can be a comfort in that of of like oh somebody has a plan mm -hmm. um uh, and the plan may change a million times but you know definitely go in with a plan at, at least you're acting like you've got a plan right it, so. uh, always yeah <laughs> well beginning with Wes craven's new nightmare it seems like you became Wes Craven's kind of go-to editor. Um, he's no longer with us, of course, but he left us, mm. you know, one one hell of a legacy. Um, what was your relationship with him like as editor and director, and later on as producer and director? Um, you know, I I got along uh, really well with Wes uh, as an editor, and uh, I found I found his the footage that he shot was always um, very intuitive uh, uh, of how it would go together. It always made 
real sense to me. I could look at it and go, okay, this is, this is what you mean. Um, uh, you know, the, the opening of scream probably is the, you know, one of the, the big things, whereas when the studio saw the dailies, uh, that's just the shots that's that kind of come in before they're cut, they were going to fire with, they, they hated the dailies for the Drew Barrymore sequence. Mm. and uh which was the first thing shot on that and uh cutting it together um i cut it all together based on what i saw and i remember talking to wes and he was very despondent about their reaction to it it's just like i don't know what they're talking about you know and i i sent wes a, a tape of the cut and he loved it and had one sort of music note and we changed the music and sent it off and they were like oh my god this works so well we're so wrong um and i think that experience uh you know we had developed already developed a lot of trust uh together you know, um, um uh cutting new new nightmare there are sequences in that that uh, are some of my favorite that i've ever cut uh you know the revolving julie's death uh, mm -hmm. the revolving room uh mm -hmm. I, I just loved how west shot that and it just went together so well um and of course it's two different locations there's the hospital location where the nurses and everybody runs up and then there's the the hospital room that spins and then a hospital room that doesn't spin um depending on uh because it was literally a set that revolved and mm -hmm. um but it's a it's a crazy sequence and there's there's so many things in that movie that that i adore that uh uh you know wes and i just uh, it gave me a lot of freedom to figure out what his intent was and uh and embrace that and uh and you know we we really established our working relationship there and and then and i think on on vampire in brooklyn as well because you know eddie murphy would do would do all sorts of different options and piecing those together and and, and wes sometimes mm -hmm. like i'm not quite sure what's going to be best and <laughs> And we'd very quickly give him options and, and Wes was, would be thrilled with them and he would show them to Eddie. And I think that helps direct the, the performance. Uh, I know um, uh, Zakes Mokai, uh, who was in Super in the Rainbow and is also in that in Brooklyn, um, uh, I think was in, was, wasn't in the best of health during that. So he'd had some challenges remembering some of his, his, his dialogue at the time. And uh, Wes was very worried about some of the, some of his dailies, and, and and it took a lot of takes to get everything to seem with him and, and Angela Bassett, and, and cutting it together, it all worked great. And and uh, and, and Wes was thrilled at, at, at how it how it came together. So I think those have, uh, gave him a lot of trust in in my ability to understand what he was what he wanted. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so. What about I remember a, the question. I'm babbling, but <laughs> what about as a as a producer when you when you jumped to the director's chair? Was he supportive in that? And was he? Yeah, no. He producer? he had a lot of he had a lot of very good uh, insight into into uh, the challenges and gave me some really good practical advice. I think um, you know I think uh, Dracula 2000 in particular was hard for everybody because it was we started shooting so late. Uh, for a movie that had to still come out in 2000 because of the title. Um, you know, uh, as everybody used to say, we're not making a movie, we're making a release date. Right. right. Um, and, uh, and the script kept changing wildly. And I, I know he found that uh, frustrating while we were going through and he and I would talk about it and trying to come up with ways to, to rein it back in. And, you know, there was a, uh, we had a really, good version in April and had and with all the different writers that came in that that weren't Joel and myself and Wes's input it was sort of destroyed it by by June and then tried to wrestle it back into something uh you know we started shooting in June and then, and, and Wes was instrumental in, in getting uh Jerry Butler Jerry was uh, Gerard Butler was somebody I wanted right from the beginning and and Wes was really supportive of that and helped land and Jerry, because uh, we had when we started shooting, we didn't we didn't have Dracula yet. Wow! Um, you know, we had delayed his his you know uh, the character's entrance into the movie. Um, you know, it, it was coming down to three or four different people, um, and Jerry had auditioned on the very first day of auditions in, in April, and 
and was in Lithuania uh, doing Attila, the Hun, the TV movie, and yeah, got my personal um, cell phone and would call me all the time. And he and I would chat. And he's oh. uh, like, well, you're not casting that guy. That guy's terrible. Uh, <laughs> and, and, uh, and, oh, I hear you casting it. You can't do that. I'm Dracula. <laughs> And, uh, and and thanks to Wes uh, stepping in, he was, which I was very grateful for. Very cool, very cool. Um, you 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 mentioned to me something that probably very few people outside of Wes's inner circle knew about him. But tell <laughs> us tell us a little bit about you know Wes Craven, not the master of horror, but you know just the man, the guy. The, you know, uh, Wes and I would, I remember him, he and I would come in, I, I think it was on Red Eye, we would talk about giant squids a lot. Um, he was, he, as he said, you were a fellow squidophile. Um, and he gave me a book on 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 uh, giant and colossal squids, because we had talked about, you know, the, the sheer amount of squids there are on the planet and how big they get. And, uh, I think at the time there had been some massive squid discovered in in uh, New Zealand, and we were, we were both quite fascinated by squids. Uh, Wes was also a huge birder, um, as a member of the Audubon Society, and and uh, who and you know at at his memorial at the DGA, the you know Michael Apted, who was the head of the, uh, who also recently passed away, was the head of the DGA at the time, the Directors Guild of America. He. He spoke at Wes's uh, uh, memorial service, as did uh, the head of the Audubon Society for California came in and, and, and played bird calls at the memorial, had his tape of bird calls, held them up and, wow. and played them as Wes was a huge birder. Wes, when we would edit, was always, you know, we had a library of, of very specific birds and the sounds that those, the bird song they would make. Um, and if, you know, it, it, Sometimes you're just like, well, just cut in some birds, and you need some birds in the background. Um, um, and and uh, you'd be like, well, that's a night, you know, that's a night bird. This is a day scene, so that doesn't work. It should be this kind of bird for this kind of part, part of part of America where it takes place. And so we <laughs> we would make sure we always had the right birds uh, singing at the right time. He was a man of of detail, and I like that. I like. That. Yeah, yeah, he was, and he was, and he was great. My, you know, my son uh, Devin, when when. Uh, uh, you know, West met him when he was two. Devin's, uh, you know, thirty-two uh, now. And um, and when you know Dev was uh, uh, six or seven, um, he uh, had his had a little thing where he would make business cards and whatever for everything. He had somebody, it was called the Everything Store. Um, and he would come into the cutting room sometimes, and and uh, and he and West always got along really well. And, Wes paid him to make uh, business cards, uh, which said uh, sanity, sanity in a unique package on one side uh, with Wes's name and then on the other. And of course, they're all handwritten to the seven year old sort of pencil and on pink paper. And, and Wes kept those in his wallet for years and years oh. afterwards uh, um, and paid him five bucks, you know, so uh, it's pretty sweet. <laughs> that's 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 really cool. That's awesome. Yeah. It, it, yeah. And I love I love the idea of, you know, forget the 21 gun salute. He got the the bird call salute, you know what I mean? Absolutely. He, he that was that I think was more important, you know, and his his his, his daughter uh Jessica Sang and and there's a, the memorial was very lovely. Uh and, and obviously very sad, but it was a great sort of celebration of Wes's life and and so many great filmmakers showed up there that I think Wes uh, you know, I remember Christopher Nolan was there, Edgar Wright was there, and obviously Toby Hooper and, and, and other you know, the, uh, uh, horror genre directors who were no longer with us. But uh, Wes would have, he would have loved that, that they showed up to be yeah. part of it. Yeah. Uh, the 90s weren't a particularly um, fruitful time for horror. And as a horror fan, <laughs> um, the genre as a whole was regarded back then from my perspective as just mm. utter trash. Um, I've told this story before, but I'm going to tell it again for context. I'm a sophomore in high school. I'm in art class. I'm on this newfangled thing called the computer on this, you know, this, this brand new voyaging, this brand new thing called the, the internet. And I'm looking up information about Halloween six, the curse of Michael Myers, because that movie's about to come <laughs> out. 
And I'm really interested to know more about that movie. Well, my best friend is seated next to me on a computer, probably looking at something completely unwholesome, but he looks over and sees that I'm looking at Halloween six and Michael Myers. And he says to me with a look of just complete and utter disgust, you don't really like those movies, do you? I mean, they all <laughs> suck, right? Fast forward about a year, him as well as all of my other non-horror friends are now completely obsessed with Scream. Uh, do you remember the, you, you just mentioned that what the first footage that you cut together was the Drew Barry, mm -hmm. was the opening, yeah. right? And yeah, the, yeah, that was the first five days of shooting. Yeah. And the Weinsteins thought it sucked. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the dailies, yeah. And then when they saw the cut scene, they were like, oh, uh, we are so wrong. What do you need? And, but, you know, they, they, uh, it gave, their wrongness gave Wes a lot of power. Uh, oh, and then the preview, it previewed amazingly well uh, in New Jersey. You know, we scored in the 80s and um, did very few changes after the preview. And, and uh, it, it, it was a really uh, great experience to have that film work so well but certainly um it was i think unexpected um that it would be so successful at, at, at what point during the editing process or or was there a point during the editing process where you were you realized like oh there's there's something really special here well we all knew that kevin's script was really good it was really mm. smart um mm. Um, and also really vicious. Wes had turned it down the year before he actually agreed to do it because he felt it was too uh, violent and he just didn't want to take that up. Um, I remember reading that opening scene. He said, just read the, read, just read the beginning. And read it like, holy shit. And, and he was <laughs> just like, yeah, yeah, I don't think I can do it. Um, and I know the studio had talked to a lot of different people about, you know, uh, a lot of different directors, many of whom were treating it like a comedy with horror, uh, which was definitely not how West saw the film. He, he saw it as a brutal, bloody, uncompromising horror movie that happened to be funny in you know out of things the characters did it um, and self-aware, but it was still first and foremost a horror movie. Um, you know, so I think. It wasn't really until the preview where we previewed it for an audience in, in, in Secaucus, uh, New Jersey, that we understood its impact, that 450 people just the whole way through were, oh, my God, um, right from the two-minute mark, you know, and Drew Barrymore, you know, the killer says to Drew Barrymore, I want to I wanna know who I'm looking at. Yeah, uh, and and you know, four hundred fifty people went. <gasps> <and there's laughs> like, well, that's um, um, and I think you know, to Kevin's credit, and 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 I'll and I'll also to Wes, but to um, part of Scream's real genius is that it's a murder mystery. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's it it. Which is a which is a form that goes back and back and back. You know, you think of how successful those have been forever and ever, um, murder mysteries. And 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 at its core, that's what it is. And I think that's what helped it go beyond just horror fans, uh, because the mystery is really smart. The killers are smarter than anybody else. The killers uh, are not discovered; they reveal themselves. Then there is no detective in the story to go, aha, it's you. Uh, you know, that doesn't happen. Um, you know, we, we, uh, we talk a lot about, and then there were none, uh, that Agatha Christie story where all yeah. the people go to the island and they're invited by you and Owen, uh, unknown, um, which is another movie where you don't discover it, the, the killer reveals themselves. No one figures it out. They reveal themselves. And, and I think that, that, you know, that's, I think that's been one of the basis of a lot of uh, slasher movies in particular. Oh, yeah. Many of the, many of the best ones are in fact, murder mysteries, obviously not Michael Myers and, and not Jason or, or who are outside of that. But, but the, uh, you know, certainly prom night terror train, 
oh yeah take your pick you know they're mm-hmm. all they're all murder mysteries yeah definitely um yeah what was the scream whirlwind like for you did it open doors to help you get your own projects off the ground or sure yeah it definitely did that and and, and i think what really did it was cutting that opening the opening sequence um is what is something that affected my my life more than anything else gave mm-hmm. gave me um because it was something you know the the studio dimension films totally thought didn't work when they were seeing the dailies and then completely thought oh my god this is this is going to be something special um um you know that got me my opportunity to edit uh mimic for guillermo del toro and then and then you know to move on to scream 2 with wes and then uh cutting uh halloween h2o and then ultimately directing um uh prophecy 3 and dragon 2000 that all came from screen that all every opportunity came from from cutting screen mm-hmm. uh, absolutely one thing that i think you know, you know when people talk about scream in the 90s they talk about how it sort of revived horror and it did but it also really mm-hmm it revived the masters of horror because those guys, you know, mm. Wes and Toby and John Carpenter, the late eighties, early nineties weren't particularly kind to them uh, or their movies really. And I mean that mm. new and scream really br- put movies like Halloween and um, even some of the more lesser known movies, like the talent rated sundown, there was like a big rush for people trying to find the talent rated sundown after screen came out. I remember. Yeah. Um, so it really did a lot for the genre and for, you know, the, the masters of, of horror. Cause well, it, 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 yeah, it made it, it made it legitimate theater. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, there was a legitimacy to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, and certainly to, to Dimension's credit, you know, part of the, their casting model, um, you know, casting Beth Campbell, casting Courtney Cox, Courtney Cox, you know, it's just Friends becoming a huge hit, you know, early in the days of Friends was her, you know, being cast in that Neve Campbell from Party of Five, um, you know, that uh, and Drew Barrymore, they, 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 and their whole thing is we want to cast people who we can get on talk shows. We want to cast people who people want to see. Um, you know, that old uh, is sort of a joke now, the dimension poster of all the sort of young faces, the, yeah. the hip faces on the yeah, poster, yeah. Um, which they nailed to death. But that was, you know, that all came out of screen and, and the casting screen, which was incredibly smart. Um, yeah. And, and, uh, you know, the, the faculty exists because of screen, you know, that, you know, all those things that, uh, certainly, uh, uh, I know what you did last summer, the same sort of thing, even though that's not to mention, but, but it certainly is Kevin and, and falling under that, under that same, and then there's the same sort of rules, you know, pretty people dying. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't want to see that? Yeah. Yeah. I hate those damn pretty people. Um, yeah. <laughs> one one interesting thing about Scream though is there there has to be like three or four different cuts of that movie out there because uh, at least on on physical media because the VHS release that I first saw was different from the DVD release that I bought and I believe the cut of the film that I have on Blu-ray lacks the gore that was on the VHS but there's a couple of more scenes that that weren't on the DVD how does that happen and who decides um which well, in Scream, of- I, I think the only differences are um, there was an NC-17 version and an R version. Hmm. Um, the NC-17 version, I think you could get on VHS and Laserdisc, hmm. but I don't think it's ever been available on anything else. Um, I think I just gave away my Laserdisc version of that. <laughs> How the hell did I do that? <laughs> <laughs> because it's a laser disc and it probably the has laser, laser rod. And who oh, wants yeah. that? You know, it's big, heavy, stupid, got to flip it over, um, dumb thing. Um, but it's, um, I think those are the real only two primary versions uh, that I'm aware of uh, for screen. Um, and, and the, and, uh, and it's, so I think there's, it's maybe a minute difference. Uh, and amount not even that much. It, it, it's, you know, the uh, the I'm trying to remember what the what the 
the, you know, we went back nine times um, to try and get with the MPAA, trying to get an R rating. Um, and because that was, you know, they objected to the, so much of the violence in the film. Um, and it, uh, uh, you know, certainly the Drew Barrymore, there were some things in that sequence, particularly the, the push in on the, on the Drew Barrymore hanging, you know, when she's hanging from the tree at the end. Um, Steve Orth's guts spilling out, um, uh, the stabbing at the end with Billy and Stu when they stab each other, um, uh, uh, Tatum's head getting crushed. Um, uh, I think that that's what I, that's, that's what I knew Scream was to be taken seriously. When Steven Orth's guts fell out on the ground, I was like, oh. This is this is good. This is good. And yeah. then you know, yeah. you see uh, Drew Barrymore hanging there, and her insides are steaming on the outside. Like this is a good yeah. movie. So well, and it 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 um, you know, I think one of the things that in this to to Kevin's credit is 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 killing Drew's character at the beginning, killing Casey, who feels like she's the lead of the movie. Right was it was ballsy right that was the sure. that's a total killing marion crane thing that mm-hmm. that's that's what that was it you know you takes you right back to psycho um you know where you're following this character for the first you know chunk of the movie you're thinking that this is who i'm following and it's like holy shit, no i'm not that's something they're dead and, and what we found uh with scream is that suddenly sec- the second you introduce nev campbell in the scene with the house where the killer chases nev in the house the first time where dewey shows up on the side um and, and people were positive you were going to kill her that she was going to die because you had already shown that you were willing to do that wes had always said you have to make the audience think you're crazy you have to make the audience think they are unsafe in your hands you do not want them to think that that uh that they are in a safe space. Um, And, and then the, you know, that kind of opening buys you um, character development (laughs) afterwards. You can spend 40 minutes meeting everybody. I mean, uh, (laughs) Halloween H2O did it, uh, you know, with the whole uh, uh, Joseph Gordon Levitt, uh, uh, you know, like the shape killing at the beginning with the nurse. Uh, um, You know, we did it in, in my bloody Valentine. My bloody Valentine. You know, we did. We followed that model Ex- exactly. Let's have an opening that's that's whack a mole crazy and has also crazy, crazy evil shit in it, so that people go, "Oh my god!" And then you can like, "I'm here." The characters in this small town. Let's meet them. Mm-hmm. Um, but it buys you that. I don't know if goodwill is the right word, but it certainly buys you the breath to do it uh, yes. from the audience. That they they're like, "Okay, we're in." Well, and it, and it also really lays, I mean, for me, it sort of laid down the gauntlet of, well, if you're going to take out Drew Barrymore this early and that viciously, nobody's safe. So, I mean, nobody's I, I love, I love that aspect of it too. Yeah. And that's always the problem with the sequels, right? The second you survive the, the, the first one, um, odds are you're going to survive the second. That's why I think it was so important to kill Jamie Kennedy in the second one, the way, the way he was killed in the middle of the movie. To to again reestablish that okay, anybody can die. Yeah, um, you know that was a very specific uh, necessity, I think, to keep the jeopardy up of the movie. Otherwise, there's just there's no jeopardy. You're not you you feel everybody's going to make it. Yeah, um, you know that that's always a thing that you have to wrestle with. Earlier, you talked about in in the editing room about. Um, some of the responsibilities of the editor, making sure that people are looking in the right way, continuity, mm, stuff mm-hmm. like that. How difficult a film was Halloween H2O to edit when you're editing together sequences where the mask noticeably changes? <laughs> and not just, not just from scene to scene, but from shot to shot. Um, you know, it, it, funnily enough, the, the first time we encountered that was in the, it was in the opening, especially of Scream. Uh, if you look at the opening screen, that mask changes like like three times. Uh, it's it, it's two very different masks, and I think there's even a third third sort of shape change in that. Um, uh, H2O, uh, you know, they they shot with one mask uh, that then very much it was like a repeat of the original screen that uh, everybody that hated, but there was certain footage that maybe we could keep. 
Um, and then they got another mask that, that the director hated. And, and then he was having a different mask that ended up being the primary mask, the, the Stan Winston mask that we, that we used. And, and they had already, you know, they had shot a lot of their stuff with the, with the mask, you know, the, that scene in the cafeteria at the end where the shape is flipping all the tables and it's night, you know, and, and, mm -hmm. and Jamie's hiding underneath them. Um, that was uh, originally all the lights were on in that scene. It was really bright. It was and, and it was and it was the sort of white uh, marshmallow smooth face uh, mask. And then it was all redone. And, and the redo wasn't just better because of the mask change. The redo was so much better just because of the lighting and everything. It was it was it was a thousand percent better. Uh, um, so you know you 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 cut do the best job with the footage you have and it's like okay so this is it and this is the replacement stuff and you know steve uh i know there was disagreements with the studio about that but steve meyer um at the end of the day you know with all the little surgical pieces of the mask that we'd shoot um you know it, i think it all worked really well um and we just sort of like okay this is here we are um, <laughs> um uh but that was a that was a movie that had a very lean amount of footage there was only two sort of scenes cut out um and uh and movies the movie's not long it's like 85 minutes i think including you know like a three minute main title and probably seven minutes end credits um and uh and you know we had a day and a half director's cut uh normally it's 10 weeks Steve came in for a day and a half and he was just like, well, well, that works. And, and <laughs> then he was off to do like Placid. And then the studio had half a day of notes. And uh, then we previewed the movie and the movie wow. scored at 88. Um, and then we did a few little changes, I think, after the preview. And then that was it. Uh, you know, the bigger problem was that we had a problem with the score. So the score yeah. was a problem. Yeah, that was a challenge. Yeah, I, I remember um, hearing something about the issues with the with the score and the score having to be replaced uh, yeah. and so on and so forth. So, yeah, if we'd had five extra days. We would have, we would have gotten rid of all of the original score, which was, which, um, I remember the studio, uh, 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 being like this, this score is trying to elevate the movie and forgets that it's a, that it's a Halloween movie that where that is, that is, there's a reason the Carpenter score works so well, because there's a simplicity and a directness that captures the, the, you know, really embodies Michael Myers, and this the other score was very orchestrated. So we we had to strip a lot of that out for it to work. And you know, as music on its own, it's totally totally fine. Mm -hmm. uh, could work really well for another movie, but I I don't I I feel it was a challenge for the movie. Um, wow. um, that was uh, because it was too. Too not the movie. Too, too uh, big. Too big. Well, it was just too. It, it just it it, it it it. The problem was is that you 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 know the score was trying to do something very different than what John Carpenter did mm. with his score. Yeah, you know, and that that was that was a mistake. Mm. Um, you know, we we that final cue that we used is from the CD from the John Carpenter soundtrack CD. That's the cue we use at the end when she's doing, when Jamie's, you know, Laura Strode standing there with the ax after she's chopped the shape's head off. Yes. I think that she actually cut the shape's head off and we must pr pretend that Halloween resurrection doesn't exist. <laughs> let's, let's, let's please pretend. That. Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm good with that. I'm good with that. Yeah. Justin. But I think yeah. the I think the Ottman score was a, a, a initial. It was eventually released on CD or vinyl or something. He so released it, yeah, 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 yeah. He released it, yeah. So, yes, he did. have you ever been pressured by, say, a director who's had creative differences with the studio to edit the film their way behind the studio's back, or vice versa? Uh, sure. Uh, yeah. How, how do you happens. how do you deal with 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 a situation like that uh you try and do what's best for the film and of course then you're relying on your own judgment on what you think is best for the film you try and yeah you want everybody that to, to be making the same movie that's always the best way to go mm. sometimes that doesn't happen so um you know you have to look at who hired you uh 
you know, certainly with Wes, that was always, you know, uh, it was easy to always align with Wes that this is, this is how it's going to go. Um, you know, it's funnily enough, the movie where we had the biggest challenges, well, two movies, uh, we had challenges on music of the heart, which, uh, was the Meryl Streep movie that Wes directed. Um, the movie would score in the high eighties, low nineties all the time. Hmm. Um, uh, but it was long and, uh, and this, the you know the Miramax kept demanding Wes cut it down, and they sent a tape of the edits that they had made on their own. And I remember Wes watching them and throwing it in the trash and telling them to fuck off, <laughs> uh, and wisely so. Um, uh, and finally, Wes appealed to Michael Eisner, who ran Disney at the time, who owned Miramax at, back then. And Eisner Eisner said, "Your movie scores so well because nobody is going to score a movie about." teaching kids uh you know uh kids uh, under underprivileged kids in, in harlem how to play the violin badly uh your movie's too long you need to cut it short mm. and we cut like 20 minutes out of it after that <laughs> uh, but it was that logic was something we could understand and it was when it was being dictated to us in really sort of hackneyed edits that were being trying to force down our necks that we didn't, you know that we did that there is so there's a way to do it that you know the way the studio was trying to do it that was was wrong um you know there are other times when i've certainly been hired by um a studio separately to come in and and you know recut something and I've certainly on the on the eye uh, you know lionsgate and uh united artists uh brought me in to recut that film and often we you know take it over and, and write and direct uh 40 pages of reshoots, um, um, you know, uh, so mm. shot over a third of the movie because the movie just didn't work. Um, and the directors were very much, you know, this is what we want. This is our vision, blah, 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 blah. And I totally, and I got that and we tried very hard to make their vision work, but then ultimately they, um, uh, went back to France and, and, uh, the studio said, uh, that's not the way we're going to go um and and uh and yeah. i was uh, the the choice to do that and and um uh, you know the the success of that experience the transformation that movie went from the early version which which to the studio didn't work uh the way they had wanted it to work um and then after the reshoots that i directed and, and uh cut in and then showed to the studio it was one of the days of showing it to, that to the studio that gave me the chance to direct my bloody valentine because uh uh the day i walked in to show them was the day they let they closed the deal on the rights um part of the reason i think they took the eye from paramount who had originally was going to make it was to get my bloody valentine hmm. which was originally a paramount movie. Right. Uh, which which Mike Pasternak, uh, who was big at uh, Lionsgate at the time, wanted uh, because he had worked on the original. He was an executive on the original mm. and always loved it. And it was just like, uh, and that's that's how that that happened. So I was, you know, in the right room at the right time. Hey, do you want to direct my bloody Valentine? Absolutely, I do. I'll find time <laughs> for it. <sure. laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about cursed. <laughs> which was uh, <laughs> that's the other one that's the other one i knew it Even i knew it and then cursed was the other one yeah i knew it cursed. i knew Happy it. name never work in a movie called cursed. i was gonna it's say cool very style. um pretty uh, prophetic title for that movie i think um i remember yeah. getting really ex i remember getting really excited when i first heard that kevin williamson and wes craven were reteaming and for a werewolf movie because there's not yeah and rick baker whole... was designing the werewolf and, and ex uh, exactly uh, yeah 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 so i i i i know wes had worked on troubled productions in the past but this one had to be one of the most if it had to be the one that ate up the most of his time uh, there's a lot of um th that movie's kind of legendary at this point what the heck happened with that movie um you know i wasn't i, I don't think it was a movie that anybody really wanted to make 
hmm. except the studio. Uh, you know, um, I think Wes was something like eight weeks out from directing Pulse and had a whole crew hired, ready to go when they pulled the plug on that and and sort of blackmailed him into, into making, uh, 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 blackmailed by that, I mean, pressured him Right, right. In a non non legal way, uh, <laughs> in, into into making uh, cursed, um, because they felt that that you know to for the the reteaming of of uh, uh, Wes and Kevin and, and you know that that group uh, felt like uh, that guaranteed money. Um, you know, Wes had read the script and felt it was too much like vampire in brooklyn um that you know he's and told them i don't want to make this i've made this movie and it was a problem it didn't work because it was too wasn't funny enough to be a comedy wasn't horrific enough to be a horror movie was not you know was trying to thread uh, in uh, american world in london is lightning in a bottle you know that is a really unique film how that captures comedy and, and horror um and very very tricky to duplicate mm. but that was what everybody felt they could do um well that's what the studio wanted to happen mm -hmm. i don't think anybody else felt they could do it but but you know a lot of people got overpaid to try um and then so uh i wasn't on the film at the time i was uh at the time they started i was working on Darkness Falls. I was recutting that movie and 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 overseeing the reshoots of that and, and uh, uh, visual consultant on mm. that movie, uh, Killer Tooth Fairy. Um, and uh, uh, they um, cursed. Uh, I was invited to come in and and uh, work on the film. I was going to work on it for six weeks. I was on it for nineteen months. Gosh, um, and uh, I was came on in the in near right near the end of the original fifty something day shoot, uh, maybe fifty four days or something, and they had like six days left where they were going to shoot the ending. The ending was never shot. Um, the the big climactic battle with the werewolf. Um, you know, the original version had, had obviously Ski Thorek and Christina Ricci and, and, mm -hmm. and Jesse Eisenberg, uh, but also Mandy Moore and Robert Forster and Omar Epps and uh, Ileana Douglas. And uh, I'm probably missing other people who are in it that aren't in the final. Um, and uh, then um, they stopped production uh, just before, you know, before they were going to go in and film this final confrontation with uh that would have been with uh skeet and christina ritchie and uh jesse eisberg and versus judy greer and scott bio as the werewolf oh man um so uh but he was a he was a a prodigy of judy greer's character uh, that was uh, so that uh joni and chachi that was there the you show. go <laughs> uh, literally her name her character's name was Joni. That, uh, that, that, uh, yeah, I shit you not. That was the intent. Mm -hmm. Um uh and then that uh was so that part was never shot. So that part of the movie was never finished. We, you know, recut a lot of that because I had come on very late because I was doing, you know, this other project. Um and recut a lot of it for Wes and went through and you know got it all sort of uh working um a lot of the visual effects weren't done because a lot of it was going to be cg and stuff like that there were some practical werewolf effects but there's also a lot of cg werewolf effects like you know zipper the werewolf dog um and stuff like that so the of, of the 54 days of shooting i think that first cut was uh minus the ending was like 90 minutes or something like that there were only 12 minutes in the final version of the movie wow so a whole uh, months later, um, a new version was written. A new version was shot for 40 some odd days. That version now featured 
Josh Jackson, uh, uh, John John C. McGinley, I think, was also in the other version as, as Jesse Eisenberg's dad. And the thing about Jesse Eisenberg and, and Richie and, and Skeet is none of them were related. There were three strangers who meet in the road, have a car accident, and made it. That was the original story. Um, and then in the new version, Jesse Eisenberg and Christina Ritchie have no parents, and they are brother and sister. So that wasn't in the original version. Skeet's no longer in the version Josh Jackson is in. Um, uh, Mandy Moore is gone, and then Maya now plays the Mandy Moore part in the opening. Um, Scott Maya is no longer a werewolf. Uh, Scott Foley was another one who was in it, and then and and he's he wasn't in it anymore. Um, how does how does I mean how does how does this happen? Is it all just a product of? it's people just didn't want to make the movie or the script wasn't finished or uh, good or yeah, like, it, 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 all of the above. Uh, I think it was, it was, um, it was a, a, a severe lack of passion going in. It felt like a lot of people who are, who are being sort of forced to make something they weren't really passionate about mm. that they weren't really wanting to make. So because of that, you know, when there was an, there was a version being discussed, uh, where during the hiatus, you know, where we were recutting the movie and talking about different stories, I mean, Wes and I had come up with some crazy idea where, where John C. McGinley, who we really liked in the in the thing, we thought he was great, uh, and Jesse Eisenberg were were father and son werewolf hunters, and it's like, yeah, let's make that movie, and, <laughs> and, and the studio could not have shot that down fast enough. <laughs> um, uh but the uh the um during that time uh you know as as they went through there was a hey do we just go back and shoot the ending and just finish the movie that we have let's just finish it and, and walk away from the crumbling wreckage of our dreams and, and mm. be happy that that's what we've done um or do we try something else and try and do a major reshoot so it was back and forth and back and forth. And suddenly it was, let's do a huge reshoot. And um, so, you know, what was a $35 million movie becomes a $70 million movie. And then I think that by the end of the day, so they shot for 40 some odd days. Then I think they shot for 19 days and then 10 days and then so on and so forth. There was reshoot after reshoot. It ended up costing well over 90 or a hundred million dollars. So Gosh. My because goodness. they, because, and part of it was, um, you know, you're, you're chasing something that's elusive. You're chasing mm -hmm. what you think it can become, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to trying to make the best of what you have. Uh, so that new directions, when you start going in all those new directions is, 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 well, it's like, well, really, if you're going to do that, why don't we just, why don't you just take what you have and finish it or shelve it or do whatever, and then make, take this money and make something new as opposed to uh spending you know an additional x amount of millions of dollars which is which is you know the reshoots cost far more than scream cost far more than scream 2 cost mm. so as a whole so it, it it was a crazy experience to watch it happen and to be in it um you know the version once josh jackson showed up and josh was great um the the original ending of his version is quite different it is and and has a has a um, very sort of tragic emotional ending where christina ritchie and he are definitely in love and and he uh he is the the sort of main werewolf and and says to her you know look i can't allow this to keep going you have to kill me and she cuts his head off at the end uh, and it's this big sort of tragic thing and it's and you see the werewolf head fly off and it lands as josh's head i think is how it went um so it sort of transforms in the air as as it's flying off and it was actually really well done and and that the preview of that version of all the previews we did for that movie scored the highest that version scored the highest so naturally we didn't finish that version <laughs> um there was a new version where they thought well 
it's it's it and that scored pretty well so now we think we can make it even better so they they kept trying different things to make it better and it, every other version just made it worse but they kept sinking a lot of money into making it worse mm. so it just it just went so far down and then suddenly josh was the villain at the end and you had that other fight at the end and you had different effects teams come in because the first effects team was like look we got other jobs uh we've already contracted to do so so because it took so long um there was a you know a huge changeover of personnel and creative direction and and, and just emotional involvement um that when you only have 12 minutes at the end uh, in the final product that are left over from that big 90 minute movie at the beginning it's it's a totally different thing and that that i think was the high school wrestling scene the zipper the dog scene uh in the house um can't remember what the other ones were but the, 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 those scenes were the same all the way through but holy fuck mm. <laughs> yeah absolutely I've- yeah, I, I've heard that you're actually in possession of all the different cuts of Cursed. With all the recent uh, hoopla over, you know, release the Snyder cuts, is it uh, can is it possible one day to see the Craven cuts or the Lucier cuts of Cursed? I, you know, I don't because it was never finished that original version. I don't. I don't think you could do it. I. I, I think you'd have to go back with those three actors who, you know, and you're going back almost 20 years, uh, mm-hmm. you know, their, their footage was shot in 2003 uh, for that first version. Um, so 18 years. And I, I don't, I, I, I don't see the, anybody wanting to pay for that. Right. Right. You know, it's not like Batman or Superman or whatever, it's, you know, the, Part of the reason people want to see the Snyder Cut is 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 the IP uh, underlying of the Snyder Cut are these classic characters that have have been around for for decades that people are in love with. That's the thing people really want to see. I want to see Snyder's version of those characters doing more things. That's whereas this is this is you know going back and a version of a what movie was that i don't even remember that movie that that's like oh that's sort of a world movie but there are these other worlds movies why did one would pay for do it so i think it i you know i having seen them i i suspect uh certainly the the alternate josh jackson version i think would be um an interesting version to finish as opposed to the original version. Um, I think that was a better version of the movie. Um, but if somebody wanted to release all three, sure. I think that would be a fascinating archival thing. I don't think it's going to happen because I think also, I don't even know where the rights are to that. Yeah. Right. Uh, you know, cause the Miramax, uh, the rights reverted you know, certain properties, you know, that with the, with the full collapse of the Weinstein empire and, and rightfully so, um, where, where all the, how all that IP got divided up. Yeah. Um, who knows? Yeah. Who knows? Yeah, you're going to a bunch a, of, a bunch, you're gonna need a bunch of lawyers just, just to even get started, you know, whereas, whereas, for the Snyder Cut, it's everything's owned by in one place. It's very, it's not cheap, but it's doable. Mm-hmm. This is like, I, I don't know. Yeah, it'd be a nightmare. It'd be a nightmare. You need it'd somebody with deep pockets and a lot of and a lot of will. Mm-hmm. That's not to say that somebody, you know, if somebody had a VHS tape and and uploaded it to the internet, you know, in some clandestine met, met way, that that would not be me. But somebody could do that. <laughs> um, uh, well, speaking of the Weinstein's, uh, Gary J. Tuncliffe, who you, who you've worked with on, uh, I love Gary. Yeah, I worked with a lot. He he once said in an interview, and I don't remember where exactly I heard it, but he said that Bob Weinstein was really mm. good about watching your movie and knowing that something 
wasn't working. Of course, but you kind of dispelled that when you said they watched the opening of Scream and were like, this sucks. So, well, but, but well, there's a difference between watching dailies and watching the movie. That's a yeah, different thing. That, that's right. That's right. Yeah. But Gary said that, that Bob could watch your movie and tell you what was wrong with it and be completely right. You know, there's, there's the, the third act needs more oomph or there's something missing here or there. And he'd be absolutely correct. But where you'd, have, an, have where the problems would arise is when he would try to tell you how to fix those problems. Um, we've all heard stories about the Weinstein brothers as, as businessmen, you worked with them on a number of projects as an editor, a director and a writer. What was your experience like working for the Weinstein brothers? Um, you know, my exposure to her, to Harvey was very limited. Uh, um, you know, I basically uh, only on music of the heart and then a recut of 54, uh, the studio 54 movie, which mm -hmm. I was on for three weeks. That that's where I had contact with him. So, you know, so that was 98 and 99. Um, and then uh, worked for primarily for Bob during those years, you know, would have contact with Bob. Um, you know, I remember when I got with Bob, uh, and the others gave me the chance to direct. Uh, the comment was, uh, I hear you're going to direct something for us. Yeah, uh, yes, yeah, so I'm excited to do it. And he was just like, yeah, we're going to kick the shit out of you. Um, <laughs> um, and and sure enough, they did. Um, <laughs> you know, they, they would have crazy notes, uh, like, you know, music, uh, rather, Prophecy 3, so... You know, it's a little direct to video movie with the last one that had Chris Walken in it, Chris Walken, who's awesome. Um, we were like four or five weeks out from shooting, and and they say, This character that's the main character, we want to get rid of them. This character that's the hero, we want to make him the villain. This character that has one line of dialogue, we want to make her the main character that we follow all the way through the movie. And you're just like, what? And, and, <laughs> and, and I remember Joel Swisson saying as he was trying to piece together this Frankensteinian nightmare that the script was becoming, he said, you know, we just have to love every mutant child. <laughs> um, and sure enough, we were making a mutant child. Um, you know, the first version was about uh, Roswell and it was not being a, an alien artifact that had landed, but an angel. An uh -huh. angel was being kept in Area 51, and it had been uh, bleeding for 50 years. Wow. And they had just all these vats of blood. And 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 it, anyways, that got thrown out four weeks before we started shooting, and or four or five weeks before we started shooting, and, and we shot the movie that we shot. Uh, and the main character was this detective who was trying to get pregnant, and, 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 and that character ended up being in one scene played by Jack McGee. Uh, and I worked with Jack a couple times. Jack was in Drive Angry, and he was he played Flat, Flat Lou in, yeah, in Drive Angry. And Jack was great, but it was, uh, it was so strange. It was, I, I remember being like, well, well, ah, how does that work? Um, they would make some casting choices that were challenging. Um, but, you know, that that was, you discover later that there may have been reasons for that. But, right. uh, um, um, uh, what were, you know, what were, they, what were you going to do with all that angel blood? What was, what was, um, the, the end of it took place in a lake of blood. Wow. It was like a dry, a, like, it's like the salt flats that we sort of shot partly on. We're literally going to start to bleed. And the whole thing was a lake of blood. And there was a scene where Chris Walken drives up in his angel. Gabriel drives up in his, in his, uh, uh, Lincoln with the suicide doors and, and fantails through this lake of blood. <laughs> it was, it would have been spectacular. Oh, but, that sounds uh, awesome. Yeah, yeah, we didn't make that version, but oh. um, you know, and and Dracula two thousand, we had all sorts of crazy things. You know, uh, Van Helsing's death was originally very different, and we got told we weren't allowed to shoot it the day before we were going to shoot it. Oh, oh you can't do that; it's going to be too violent. You know, you know, we're getting all these problems because of 
because of Columbine and things like that, and all these, you know, there was a, uh, you know, uh, federal uh, uh, committees and everything about violence right. movies and promoting an MTV and all this other stuff. So the, it was becoming a huge problem. So, so we kept having to change things right before we were going to shoot them, so it sort of throw things out. Um, and it was like, ah, okay, so I guess he dies from sadness. <laughs> <laughs> well and that, that's like you know um can, can, can you change i know you start shooting tomorrow can you make this a frankenstein movie instead oh, can you make yeah, a frankenstein yeah. 2000 yeah yeah sure yeah we can do whatever you want we did we so, did some market uh, research and people are tired um, of dracula they want to see frankenstein but i but i will tell you that um for for every challenge that i received they gave me opportunity I know I would never have had that opportunity to direct. It was not easy. And, and, uh, but I was grateful for the opportunity. Um, you know, uh, got to keep working, got to pay my bills, got to, you know, uh, uh, put my son through school, got to, you know, the, the, all those things happened because of those jobs. So, so, you know, I, I remember Peter Powell, the director of photography on, on Dracula 2000. Um, you know, Peter did uh, Crouching Tiger. Uh, he was color timing Crouching Tiger in Toronto while we were uh, while we were shooting in Toronto. And he he said uh, to me, you know, do you, do you do should we should we resign? You know, I'll, yeah, I'll quit with you. They're doing these, these crazy things with the story. Uh, you will quit together. And it's just like Peter. I, I can't. I, I you know, this is a job. I. I've invested so much time and, and, and I, I need to just keep going. And, uh, and there's like, all right, if you're going to keep going, I'll keep going with you. Um, you know, in the original version of that script, John Lee Miller was, uh, was a prodigy vampire hunter of Van Helsing's and, and the scene in the beginning where he shows this crossbow, he was actually showing this, this ancient sort of Grecian urn and then he smashes it and inside is this vampire head of this vampire that he's just killed in Greece and, and, and that he does, he runs all these missions for Van Helsing. And I mean, it was, a, and that's the character that Johnny V. Miller signed to play. And he shows up and it's just like, whoa, what happened? Uh, and he's just, just like, look, man, I'll, I'll, you just tell me what you want me to do, and I'll do it. And, and, you know, and so I was very grateful for a lot of the cast I got to work with, the crews I got to work with, and, and sort of the camarader camaraderie of, of working with them and having those opportunities as hard as they were. Um, uh, certainly, uh, you know, I appreciate having the chance to yeah. do it so you know it's a double-edged thing it's it's uh, years ago clark henderson uh was a post supervisor um would say they don't pay you for what you do they pay you for what they do to you mm. um which always felt deadly accurate for the experience <laughs> of working for that 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 actually reminds me of a story that todd uh, was telling when I did one of these with him. It, 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 it mm. was over, it was over a payment dispute. Um, I don't remember if you, <laughs> I know the I, one. I, I, it, it, it was either over uh. the Halloween, the Halloween three script or the Hellraiser remake script. I don't remember, but they, they weren't, they refused to pay you for work that you'd done. Uh. And Todd was particular, Todd said that he was particular and particularly angry about it because he was shocked that they would do that to you as you were somebody who'd come in and save their asses on a number of occasions. And they were, mm holding you up for a little bit of, of money. And he said, I'm paraphrasing here, but you told him something to the effect of they, to them, it's a game. And when you stood up it to is. them and threatened to sue them, you, they, you, they looked at that like, Oh, I, did, I didn't even threaten but, to sue them. I threatened to expose them. I said, I threatened to expose the practice so back when everybody was afraid of deadline Hollywood. I was, I threatened to go to them. <laughs> ah, but they oh, uh, yeah. Todd said that they kind of it, it was almost like they liked the fact that you stood up um, they did yeah 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 because yeah. because they I, I remember it being like I oh, just have to you just have to give me a few thousand dollars off I have to have something I have to have something I can't pay you the full you know the full the full your full rate because first they try to pay us half and it's just kind of like dude 
you you bought the steak, you ate the steak, and right. now you don't want to pay for the steak. So if you're at a restaurant, how's that going to work? They're not they're not going to say, oh, okay, we can now negotiate the price now that you've eaten it. Um, and uh, it called me up like two months later or, uh, in the middle of shooting on the highway, uh, uh, shooting a, a scene on uh, Drive Angry where where we were leading Nick Cage driving the wrong way through traffic. Um, and Bob calls me uh, and I, you know, in between takes, I call back and says, I just wanted to, I just wanted to apologize. I shouldn't have done that. I was just like, well, that's okay. I get it, you know. It, it, but it was, you know, we won. We got paid, and then we got paid for paid for Hellraiser as well. And and um, but it's a negotiation. It's just like I was kind of like, well, we don't want to pay you for this because of that. And it's just kind of like, well, you sort of gotta. Yeah. Uh, um. Yeah. So. You know, I was I was lucky that they did. I think for a lot of other people, they would probably say they didn't have that experience. So, um, yeah. you know, um, but I had a you know a marketable skill that that they felt was useful. Mm. So, you know, that was you know, you, you got if you have if you have a lucky penny you need to use sometime, you better you better not throw it in the drain. There, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Well, you've worked with some of my favorite uh, actors as a director. The mm. legendary, the legendary Tom Atkins, the legend, oh, the legendary Tom. Atkins. Love Tom Atkins. I, the, I, I adore Tom Atkins. The late Rutger Hauer, who's unfortunately no longer with us. Such a great actor. Larry, and, a, a, he gave me my bet. Yes, and and the enigmatic Christopher Walken in Prophecy Three. Can you, any, I'm sure there's probably a million interesting stories, but any interesting stories of uh, working with Mr. Walken on Prophecy 3? Uh, I loved working with him. He was, he was incredibly kind and, and generous. Um, he, uh, it was in the middle of him, he was going back and forth to London while they were shooting uh, his parts on Sleepy Hollow. Mm. Um, so he had to go early to get you know, his head cast and stuff like that, and then come back and then go. Um, and we only had him for seven days and, um, Chris was great. He was, he was incredibly kind to me and to, uh, you know, I was, in, I had never directed anybody of his caliber and, you know, I directed a dog before. So, <laughs> uh, um, so he was, um, you know, when you first work with Chris, what he does is uh, he uh, he invites you to his hotel and you sit down. And he reads through you know, all the script. You know, he part of the reason, and I think it's well known now that his his syntax is so sort of strange when he speaks, is that he takes out a lot of punctuation. He rewrites all the passages of dialogue, removes all the punctuation. So he just takes breaks wherever he takes breaks. So that's why his speech pattern is so unique. Um, and he reads through the script. He he reads the script and he does this and he talks about this and that and and, um, uh, and then he says he's excited to do it and then he comes back near the end and you and you shoot all this stuff and he was great with the other cast members and and was very uh, kind to them. He and Vince got along very well. Vince Spano, um, I know, with uh, Karen one day in her death scene. Um, she had all this dialogue with him and, or he had all this dialogue in the scene. And he was like, oh, maybe I should try where I don't say anything. I'm going to do it where I don't say anything. And she was just like, and she was shivering because she wasn't wearing, you know, her wardrobe wasn't enough and it was cold as windy. And she's just like, I don't know when to speak. <laughs> and he's just like, I'll, I'll say the last. <laughs> um, but he was, he was great. And he, you know, we had, we, uh, before we got Christopher Plummer um, to play Van Helsing in Dracula 2000, we offered uh, the role to, uh, to uh, Christopher Walken. And, uh, and he ended up passing. I think he was off to do Kangaroo Jack or something at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, but he was like, I'm trying to reinvent myself as Fred McMurray. Uh, <laughs> he was, he was entering sort of the Disney phase of his, of his career, yeah. you know, yeah. the mouse hunts and things like that. So he was, he very much wanted to, wanted to not 
do something that where he was, you know, injecting uh, Dracula's blood from that he'd extracted from leeches. So, <laughs> I, uh, I, I, I love all three of the prophecy movies. I think the first one is, is really kind of a masterpiece. Um, oh, the first one's brilliant. I think Greg did a great job. Greg. Walker. Oh yeah. And, uh, and uh, Christopher Walken as the angel Gabriel, just uh, absolutely uh, perfect uh, casting. He's so good uh, in those roles. He's got such uh, great dialogue. Like, you know how you got this right here? Yeah, Before yeah, you were yeah, born, yeah. I put my Church. finger there. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, oh such yeah. great. Yeah. Such great stuff. Yeah. yeah. Then, and you think of the first one, Vigo's in it as Lucifer. Right? Oh, I know. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It, the cast is, is wonderful. And, and, um, yeah. And I think Chris always really liked those movies. His angel movies, as he called oh, them. Yeah. I think he, I think he really enjoyed making them and, and, and the character and sort of, the. Uh, theatricality of the part oh yeah um you know so many of the the mannerisms and everything in the in those movies are just all chris you know that he created everything those angels do the sniff in the air that was all him and you know when uh joel sasson told me the story that when eric stoltz and so if i'm getting this wrong this is the third hand story when eric stoltz came on to play simon in the original prophecy um the first thing he did was ask to look at Chris's dailies to watch what he was doing. And so that he saw what Chris was doing as an angel and then uh, came up with his own version of that uh, uh, so that there was a consistency in the otherworldliness of the performance. Oh, that's, that's really smart. Yeah. That's yeah. yeah. I mean, you cool. just think, well, wow, that's, that's brilliant. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You were going to say something about Rutger Hauer, and I cut you off. I, oh, I, 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 love I, 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 I love Rutger. Rutger taught me more about directing actors than I think any other actor I've worked with. He was, he was just, he, I only had him for a few days. He came early. He stayed late, uh, you know, longer on this on our shooting schedule. Um, he was Santa Claus for the entire Romanian crew. He went to Santa, we shot, we finished with him just before Christmas. And he, he went to, you know, an orphanage in, 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 um, uh in bucharest where we were shooting and uh you know as santa claus um uh, i think he did i think he did even a lecture at uh, one of the local universities uh, for the drama department where the lecture was hang was doing hamlet but he was doing hamlet as a vampire uh <laughs> Rucker was like an artist he was totally different in in, in just yeah yeah, you know, he was a big, kind, gracious man with hands as big as a bear's. <laughs> well, that whole speech at the end of um, Blade Runner before his character dies—that well, was him. Yeah. That was him. He wrote yeah. that. Yeah, uh, that's him. Yeah, yeah. And but that, and that's him. He's 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 he had a poet's mind for sure. Yeah. Uh, and he talked about you know having acted with Christopher Walken and how much he loved it. He how in awe of Christopher Walken he was. We talked about. It. Chris and, and oh it was it was so great and, and you know so it was, you know he's he was an interesting guy That's um, awesome. yeah um you, you you talked a lot about earlier about some of the obstacles that you had to overcome when it came to Dracula 2000 back in December it was the 20th anniversary of that film's release and you posted yeah. on on Facebook and you said that um, uh, you you wrote a better movie than you were allowed to shoot. You shot a better movie than you had time to edit, and you cut the best movie in the time that was allowed. What was your yeah. original ver original vision for Dracula 2000? Um, the original version of Dracula 2000 was sort of the 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 thief opening um only the thieves knew what they were stealing they weren't just going in blindly to go hey this guy's got a vault let's go see what he's got which is what the movie is um but they were going like uh we know this guy has a vampire and we're gonna sell immortality mm. we're gonna take it and we're gonna sell it we're gonna milk it and sell it for a million dollars a dose that sounds mm -hmm. like the that sounds that kinda kind of like that sounds like the premise for Dracula 2002. 
Right. That 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 was the original movie. So the original movie was the thief movie that combined with the swing pool movie. The difference with the swing pool movie is that the the swing pool was full. He was put in an island. The water was all had crosses all sunk in it. It was all like holy water and uh, the sun lamps and then had this sort of Hannibal Lecter thing in the beginning and then went off into into the end uh, that sort of directly 2000 has. Um, but the end uh, was was always um, uh, Dracula always won in our version. Now then, you know, we got rid of the swimming pool movie and, and changed that, and we switched it to New Orleans because originally it all took place, I think, in London. Um, and uh, you know, there wasn't a plane sequence, and then we added the plane sequence. They go to New Orleans. Why are they going? to New Orleans where well, they, they were originally going to New Orleans is because we wanted a swamp. We wanted the swamp because we wanted uh, a scene where Dracula comes out of the water uh, with uh, uh, Jerry Ryan. Uh, originally that was in the middle of a, a whole sort of swamp area. And he comes out, he's, he, he's standing there naked, but you don't know it's him first. It's just this weird thing that's moving all over. And it's him naked covered in mosquitoes. And all the mosquitoes feed him, and all the mosquitoes scatter off. And throughout the rest of the movie, people are getting bitten by mosquitoes. And everybody's starting to get infected because he's using the, the, the mosquitoes as a, as a disease vector to infect the population. And the whole thing of when he has the Dracula's Judas thing, the conversation with you know with Christ on the cross at the end of you made the world in your image, now I remake it in mine, uh. is a direct reference to the mosquitoes and the whole fact that at the end he has won. He has changed the planet to a planet of vampires as a big fuck you. Wow. That was the original concept. That's and really, then we made the movie we made. <laughs> that's really cool, man. How I mean what uh, you 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 mentioned that you got some crazy notes, but I mean, that that sounds it, really cool. It, it's uh, how many yeah. how many how many great movies are ruined by short sighted, dumbass studio executives? Um. Well, you know, probably as many are, uh, as as saved by them. I'm sure there's uh, you know a lot of who go in and have brilliant ideas, and then there's a lot that uh, you know that was. Um, the changes that were made to that weren't any of them. <laughs> um, it was very, it was, it was disappointing when we started losing and, and it's like, you know, we didn't lose everything at once. We just right. kept losing it in pieces. So it's that death of a thousand cuts and suddenly you're yeah. like, whoa, well, where did that stuff go? And now it's this and how's this work? And, and, you know, we did 12 days of reshoots on Dracula 2000 because we had to try and make work all the things that had changed while we were going that no longer made sense, but we still had, you know, this piece didn't make sense that went to this and this. And so we're trying to, you know, Nathan Fillion's character in that movie didn't even exist in the original. He's completely in the reshoot. It's just like, okay, we need this and we need this moment to explain this and to explain that. And, and, and so, you know, Nathan came in for a day and, and, and shot for us. And, and we're so grateful to have it. And, uh, but yeah, it was, um, Crazy time, you know, and, and and I love the much darker ending than the like you know he's forgiven and he lets the one oh, character he re yeah. he releases yeah. her you know um, yeah. oh, that's I'm, that's not the ending I I I as you know as in my bloody Valentine I'm a big fan of the killer getting away at the end. <laughs> um, was, and Dracula to me was the hero right he was the hero of the story he was the one in the line he was the he was he was the guy who is this was his vengeance story let's see him get his vengeance and mm. uh, we did but yeah that to me was the the thing that would have been was cool. were, were were the ones things like. Him getting the best of Jesus. That's not going to play in the Midwest. You got to change that. Uh, you know, uh, you know, that was, uh, yeah, wasn't quite, wasn't quite that. There was, a, there were other things that were issues, <laughs> but it was just, it just became, you know, Wes really liked that version, but even that, you know, he had other things of his own that he was doing. So that sort of got, you know, distracted from Yeah. that as we went and, and, um, and because we were racing so fast, things would get changed and people couldn't keep up. Um, yeah. 
you know, the speed of it allowed you to a, you know, not like cursed where it goes on for like two years of, of hemorrhaging money and things like that. You can do that. Yeah. But you, in a short period of time, there was, it was much harder to keep track of the things that worked and the things that didn't and, and how we were putting them all together. Yeah. Um, you know, it is a movie I read cut on my head because I know there's other footage there that we could have made work better and, 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 and just little things like that. You know? But there was, wasn't the time. I still, I still like Dracula 2000. I remember watching no, it. I do too. I, uh, I watched yeah, it in the I'm theater. Glad. Yeah. Uh, when it first came out, I remember th- like the scene where he walks through the Virgin mega store and he's just kind of, <laughs> what is this place? Um, yeah. I thought that was cool. Uh, yeah. We, yeah, we didn't get paid anything by, by Virgin. People thought we did. We didn't go. We just thought it was a fun joke. Dracula what? going to a Virgin mega store. We thought it was funny. So. And of course, having Jerry Ryan and Jennifer Esposito and vitamin C as the vampire brides. That's, that was always yeah. cool. Yeah, well, yeah, we love that too. We thought that was great fun. Yeah. 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 Well, let, let's, let's fast forward a few years to the beginning of what I like to call the Lucier farmer connection. Mm. How did you first meet Mr. Farmer? Uh, I was working on Darkness Falls. Todd was writing a movie called Scarecrow. Um, and uh, Darkness Falls had previewed uh, and scored like a 25. And then I had come in to recut the movie and um, uh, and you know, come up with some reshoots and, and, and supervise the reshoots and sort of kind of direct with with Jonathan Lee's from the, the reshoots that were done and uh, and the movie scored a 75. Um, and after that preview where it scored a 75, they were like, hey, do you want to direct this other movie for us called Scarecrow? Yes. And then Todd and I met and he was in the middle of doing some rewrites and, and um, uh, ultimately the studio decided they didn't want to make horror movies anymore. <laughs> and they put the, <laughs> put the with the script and turnaround and it went over to ghost house and was made as the messengers with the, uh, you know, with the Penning brothers. Yeah. Uh, Danny and outside side. Um, and, um, uh, and then Todd's script, the version that is closer to Todd's original script was made as the messengers too with Norman yeah. Reedus. Yeah. Um, so that's how we met. What's the collaboration process like between the two of you? Uh, we write in, 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 uh, we often, when we, uh, when we write together, well, uh, do it, uh, we used to do a lot of Google chat or in Google docs and we'll just sort of, you know, add, do, do things until it becomes whatever. And then Todd will usually do it first pass the script and then I'll come in behind and mess around. And, um, uh, but we're very, you know, uh, almost always in sync and what we think and stuff and bounce ideas, crazy ideas back and forth. Um, you know, Todd came in and, and uh, did, did some help for me on the on the reshoots of the eye. And then he did the rewrites, all the rewrites on My Bloody Valentine. Um, uh, you know, My Bloody Valentine, we, we went through having, you know, there was the first version that Axel was the killer, like the original. Then there was a version where the killer was just Harry Warden. And then the final version, which is, you know, the killer was Tom. There was a version where Tom and Sarah, Jamie, Jamie King's character were killers together. That version was really weird. Um, <laughs> um, and it was just like, oh, that ain't going to work. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, but, you know, and then he did that. And then, of course, he, you know, got to be in the movie. And we came up with Try Angry together. But, it, you know, in between, we had written some other things. We had pitched a, a, a crazy... Um, underwater ghost story which was really cool and uh but would have cost a gazillion dollars and and uh we pitched a version of the hills have eyes remake um to west and everybody um you know they went with the center Oscar version but we pitched a version of that um yeah we and and just uh, uh you know and then drive angry and 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 then trick a couple of years ago but and in between there we we wrote a version of i saw what you did i know who you are uh which was uh, three days of the condor in high school was our version <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and amongst a bunch of other things that you know that don't get made because you know for, for yeah. everything that gets made there's like 10 that don't 
exactly. Yeah. I can't believe I'm just asking you this question now. Did you grow up a, a horror fan? Were you a fan of the original My Bloody Valentine? Uh, yeah. I, I remember when I was uh, watching the video store, I, when it came out on VHS. I remember it coming out in the theater, but I did not I did not see it in the theater. But I remember seeing it on VHS. Um, and, and watching so many, like, you know, Terror Train, and, the, and particularly because, you know, being Canadian at the time, they were, those were all the Canadian tax shelter movies, Happy Birthday to Me, yeah. and, uh, you know, Prom Night, and, 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 um, uh, and even go back before that to Black Christmas and things like that, you know, uh, except before, uh, mm -hmm. Bob Clark, and, and, mm -hmm. and you know, uh, Murder by the Cree is another sort of scary movie of Bob Clark's oh, yeah. man who brought you Porky's and Christmas Story. Uh, <laughs> I'm a I'm a huge I'm a huge Bob Clark fan. I think he did. Some, yeah, well, it's, his resume is diverse. Is I know it's so diverse. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, and you have to forget movies like Rhinestone and shit like that. But uh, with, uh, but he made some baby geniuses, but. Um, uh, at the top of his game, he, the movies that he would do one after another were just like, whoa, those are. Yeah. And you know, Ted Kotcheff was the same. Uh, you know, you look at First Blood and, and and who's killing the great ships of Europe. How does the same? You know, how does that guy get a chance to make those two movies? No, no, clue. Uh, no. Clue. Yeah, uh, but but yeah, I I I always liked the genre uh, and and. Uh, um, I was never really allowed to experience it. Uh, was sort of, you know, forbidden fruit. But I, I was always gravitated to it. My sister remembered giving me a copy of Salem's Lot, um, reading that book, and sort of falling in love with the genre. And then would watch it, you know, you know, flick the channel back and forth uh, when things would be on, and finally go out and see them on my own. I remember seeing Altered States in the theater when it opened up, and it's like that movie's insane. <laughs> um, I didn't like it at the time, and but now I watch that movie two or three times a year because mm -hmm. it's like, oh, that that's a crazy ass movie. And it when is. he turns into the caveman, <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, it's, it's out yeah. there, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When, Ken Russell, it, Ken Russell. When it comes to remakes, horror fans mm. and my and myself included, when we hear that a, a new remake's getting made, the chip goes right on the shoulder. Was just was, sort of fascinating. Was that, was, was that, did that cross your all's mind when you, well, cause I mean, these movies are like hallowed grounds to us. So the fact that, right. that, some, that somebody's, but, 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 but think about it, you know, invasion of the body snatchers, the Kaufman version, the fly, the Cronenberg version, the thing, the Carpenter version, those are all remakes. But, but we did get a lot with that post Texas Chainsaw Massacre remake era where we got like the fog remake and we got the history. Yeah, yeah. I, I I'm not I'm not denying that. But, but were... I, I'm just I'm just saying that 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 the horror genre has has done well with remakes. Like some of the the most classic iconic horror movies of all time are remakes. It's true. And and My Bloody Valentine was an enormous success as a remake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I you know when we did it. You know, Todd and I talked about it, and 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 certainly talked about it with with Lionsgate. We very much wanted to be faithful to the original. We wanted to keep the mining town. We wanted to keep the whole sort of mining motif. Uh, the opening sequence that we did, we very much wanted it to feel like a like a truncated version of the original film. Mm. Um, you know, that was that was. Uh, something uh that i know even you know zane smith the original writer of the of the remake you know he, uh it was something we all wanted to have that um the thing you know i liked about the original and even liked about the you know the remake is that it's ultimately they're both horror movies about adults right, right. um yeah you know, uh, there's there was something about that that was really appealing um trying to pretend to be one <laughs> myself <laughs> um but you know it it you wanted you didn't want to just throw out you know what existed before you wanted to have respect for the for the original and and, and um um and approach it in a way that 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 never forgot why you existed right right 
So that was definitely the, the philosophy going in, um, uh, was doing that, you know, I think, uh, and tone, trying to keep the same sort of tone of the original. You know, I think in the, the, the Fright Night remake is not a bad movie as a movie. Uh, I think David Tennant's great in it and Colin Farrell's great in it, but it's tonally so different right. than the original Tom Holland movie. Like it's totally disparate, um, and and it 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 takes away from um, your memory of the joy of that original film is really specific, uh, and and anyway, we just wanted to to have that. Oh, well, our goal was to try and capture that feeling again, whether we did or not. That's. You know, I think I think um, I think you did. I think you did a very good job of doing that. I I, no, I think you. you did a very good job with the the love triangle aspect of it. Um, I, I loved the casting of Jamie King because she seems like so. You know, she's like a former model. Now she's playing like this stripped down. She works at a grocery store, but she made it work. You know what I mean? She made yeah. it work. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. And 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 yeah. of course you you cast Tom Atkins. That's like an A in my book right there. <sighs> Gotta love Tom Atkins. You gotta love Tom. Love Tom, you know, Tom Atkins. No, when we got Tom Atkins, uh, then uh, his part came bigger, and, and and originally that character died in the opening. <laughs> and it's, and oh, no. you know, Tom is just uh, he's he's a he's a treasure, the Silver Fox. Absolutely, he's a he's a he's a treasure. He's a legend, and uh, yeah, let's never yeah. forget that. Whose yeah. idea? Whose idea was to make the film in three D? Studios, they they wanted to make it in 3D because they felt they could market it. Um, uh, shooting native 3D at the time was a real sort of uh, challenge. I'm going to turn this light on just because it's beginning to get dark. Um, and then I'll come back in. Um, uh, but they wanted to make it in 3D, uh, the studio. So we uh, learned how to do 3D uh, and learned how to do native 3D. So we shot with 3D cameras and, and you know camera systems that were built like the day before we started shooting. And wow. almost every day we were shooting, people would be like, oh, yeah, these are, you know, nobody's ever done this before. <laughs> it's like, oh, <laughs> man, do we... Do we have to be the first? Um, but yeah, we did. So you know, we're very, we're very lucky. We had the experience uh, to do that and to and to um, figure out how to do that. Uh, it, it was a uh, uh, technically a real challenge. That's that was a film where my editing background was incredibly helpful in order to um, uh, just figure out how to get through the days that were. And we also were fighting Jensen's schedule because Jensen had to go back to Supernatural and any day, and we were right up against his start date and any day we went over that he was delayed going back would cost our production $200,000 for every day wow. that he was late. So we, no matter what, he, he was on time. <laughs> uh, we finished uh, right with him, with him right, uh, even before we were supposed to. So, uh, but, he was great about it. He was a total pro. I love, I love working with him. Any other challenges with shooting in 3D, trying to get everything sort of lined up and. Oh, God, everything. Yeah. 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 I mean, it, 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 at the time, uh, it would take like three times the amount of light. And we shot underground in real locations, and you were shooting with a camera system that was about the size of a refrigerator. Uh, so, you know, uh, they made it so that you could, you know, cause you're shooting one camera shooting into a mirror, uh, and the other shooting through it, through the mirror, like a two-way mirror. And so your, your camera's sitting sort of low cause you've got this part of the body. And so we had to make it so the camera could flip like this. So when you're in a mine and your clearance is only like six feet, you need to be able to scrape along the, uh, and they, you know, Max Penner, uh, the stereographer, designed a system where we could flip it over in like five minutes. But uh, it was the light. You needed so much light for exposure. And you needed to light more so you could really take advantage of 3D and all the depth. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, lots of challenges. But I, I would totally make one again. I think it's a beautiful process. But nobody shoots native 3D anymore. I, I yeah. think it's all post-conversions, which... Aren't, aren't quite as, I don't think they're quite as beautiful. I think the native 3D, you know, when you have somebody who is literally expanding and contracting 3D during the shot, 
you know, one of my favorite 3D shots in Valentine is and the bloody hand standing there with, you know, Tom Atkins is in the background and and sort of pulling the hand out into the foreground. And, you know, that's all happening live. Somebody is literally doing that, uh, making that switch. So, you know. the The one thing I've always, whether people like the remake or not, the one thing they always kind of point out is, oh, man, Tom Atkins' death is so cool. <laughs> yeah, jaw getting ripped off. Yeah, so. yeah. That that I that was a that's a fun thing. That's uh, uh, yeah, yeah. His death is pretty is pretty. Uh, as they say up in Canada, it's pretty skookum. Skookum. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. A, of course, the movie was an enormous success at the box office. Um, Todd and I spoke a little bit about this during our stream about uh, i believe he said that you guys had already signed on for a sequel you already maybe had a, the the sequel idea like pretty much you, yeah. had, you know you had it done what happened there was it pot was it the uh, studio politics or changing of yeah, the card? I, think I i think the the studio had 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 not really wanted to make the movie anyway the heads of the studio um uh, mike passer and i definitely wanted to make the movie and, and figured out that with marketing's help that marketing knew they could sell the movie so marketing uh, backed the making of the movie um and the rest of the studio went all along with it this uh, i think the rest of the studio thought we were fairly i think we were one of one of the comments was this just feels like it's a blunt blow to the head it's just like eh. <laughs> That's not inaccurate. <laughs> <laughs> and and the, the marketing department, they did do a spectacular job. Oh, they job did a spectacular job. They, they, they loved it and got right behind it and uh, sold the hell out of it. We were so yeah, grateful yeah. for that. They, you know, and we only had three weekends in theaters because Coraline was coming out afterwards. And there were so, you know, we were only in like 900 some odd 3D theaters at the time. So... Uh, it made a great amount of money in its 3D screens uh, in a very short period of time. Um, it's shocking uh, that for a movie, because everybody expected, mm. oh, well, the movie did so well, there's got to be a sequel coming out. And the, yeah, the, yeah, it, the, the door true. was definitely <laughs> left. The door was definitely left open for a sequel, and it yeah, just it yeah. just never happened. I mean, why not? I, I mean, a studio not wanting to cash in on a success like that? What? They they just decided they didn't want to make movies like that. Uh, like they sort of got out of making genre movies. They did like uh, I think Killers, the Ashton Kutcher spy movie. After that, they did the next three days. They you know they were looking for what their new direction was going to be, which ultimately you know um, uh, became like the Hunger Games, right? um, um, which was uh, uh, you know, which are those are great movies, um, but they were trying to steer away from being such a genre specific studio. Um, uh, and as such, they, they, you know, we went back to them several times like, Hey, we've got this idea. We kept sort of modifying the, the idea as the years would get away from the original. Um, and we check in with like Jensen and Kerr and, and, and Eddie Gathegi who were all up for it coming back and being part of it. And, and, uh, um, had, you know, uh, had the very first version we wrote took place like uh, probably an hour after the original ended in a in a in the hospital, and uh, uh, ended up killing Jamie King's character in that beginning, and Ooh. and yeah, uh, and because she goes to find a phone as Axel is being taken into the operating room to to call her mom or whatever who's looking after the, their son and. And the room she goes into the phone, she sees all these bloody footprints, and it goes up to Tom there, who's like stitching himself up. <laughs> and uh, mayhem ensues. And then there was another version as we got rid of that version that started in a bar and, uh, or started with a mine rescue that Tom's room. Yeah. Anyways, they, were, they would have all been spectacular. But uh, huh. uh, yeah, if they decided they want to do it now, you know, uh, we would totally see it. <laughs> uh, if, you know, if we could get uh, get Jensen and, uh, and the others to come back, uh, which I think they would, um, uh, would complete you. Just yeah, um, it just it just seems like such a wasted opportunity. But um, you know, yeah, it's you know, these are in our hands, and it's not in them. <laughs> um, 
Todd and I talked a little bit about the Halloween three and the Hellraiser scripts that you guys worked on for Miramax. If I recall correctly, the Halloween three script was pretty much either done or you guys knew exactly. Oh, it was what done. It was okay. It was done. We were five, we were five weeks away from shooting. And uh, the, the, you were doing a direct sequel to Rob Zombie's Halloween. Script, yes. Correct. The, the Rob Zombie Halloween movies are divisive with fans, mm. but I, how on earth were you going to follow up zombies Halloween too? Uh, our, our version at the beginning, uh, we, uh, um, I, you know, it literally took place afterwards with, uh, um, like immediately afterwards. Uh, uh, and we end up, you know, that the first, the opening is the rest of that night what happens um and then um then we pick up like a year later um but yeah and then the year later you know the end of that opening sequence is the shape is 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 in an ambulance that is on fire and falls off the edge of a dam <laughs> um and then when you meet him the next year uh you the the one of the first scenes you see him is is he goes into a halloween store because it was going to be a 3d is he 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 breaks off the side mirror of somebody's car which says you know objects in the mirror are closer than they appear and he beats somebody to death with that reflection <laughs> you know with that with the mirror so you were going to see that smash in the face and you see him grab the old classic uh william shatner mask um, and then at one point there's a reveal later in the story where somebody rips off the, uh, uh, the William Shatner mask and you see the old Rob Zombie mask is literally melted into his face. Oh. That Michael Myers no longer exists. He is only the shape. Oh. That he has literally become this other thing. Wow. Um, but yeah. Anyways. Did, yeah. did, you, did, did uh, Scott Taylor Compton and Tyler Maine, were they signed on? Tyler was was going to come back. I, I know they had talked to Scott. I think she was resistant. She had a she had a smaller part in it. We had talked to Eddie Kafegi about being the the cop in it. Um, you know, there was obviously a part for Brad Durant, um, who I'd worked once before in Prophecy, uh, and uh, uh, and then we had a new. We had originally talked about you know Scott being the main character throughout, and they the studio had said no we want to put that character in a smaller part and give us another character that we could leap off to at the end if we wanted to do that. So, um, but the, but the end is, you know, there's a Michael Myers or rather the shape and, and, and Laurie Strode are handcuffed together. Um, there's a, there's a, there's a sequence where they break out of the mental hospital and it's, uh. yeah, it was fun. You know, one of the things I loved about zombies second movie was the nights in white satin right section yeah. you know mm -hmm. and they released that trailer uh which was unofficial oh we're not supposed to release it and they released it anyway because mm -hmm. the moody blues i think had said you're not allowed to use our song as promotion for the movie which they did <laughs> um uh, and there was something about that you know that we loved and thought was really brilliant and so that you know that concept of the two of them handcuffed together that sort of family thing and her actually, begging to die. I actually really like um, Zombies Halloween 2. I'm not a big fan of the remake, but I, I actually like Zombies Halloween 2 because that was the movie I was kind of expecting with the first one. The first one. Yeah. 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 No, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it was an interesting thing when they approached us about doing it and how quickly they wanted it to happen. Um, I think we got the call when we had gone to see Inglorious Bastards afterwards. They called us after that. Uh, and Todd and I had gone together. And uh, and then they had wanted to um, to do that in 3D. And we came up with a story. And then there's there's some some 3D kills in it that I remember being very excited about. Somebody who gets killed with an iron. You find out that one of the that Lori's been having an affair with one of the orderlies at the hospital, and and Mike, you know, the Michael Myers, the shape kills kills the orderly as in his girlfriend has been ironing their Halloween costumes. 
<laughs> anyways, was, there was fun, stupid shit in it, but it was fun. If anybody out there has any questions for um, Patrick, go ahead and post those in the comments sec. Go ahead and post those in the stream or send those as super chats. And if you're a patron or a channel member of mine, I've sent this, the, the link. So if you want to jump on and ask him a question, it's out there. Um, what can you tell us about the, the Hellraiser movie that you guys were developing? Uh, you know, the original pitch, the pitch that got us the job was something they decided they, we didn't even write the, you know, the pitch was, was, uh, basically, uh, William Fickner, who we had just worked with and, and getting him to be like, uh, Frank, it was sort of the national treasure version of Hellraiser. So it was looking for the box finding the original box and there's a point where he's in hong kong or shanghai and and uh and he goes into this building that you know was going to turn out to be its own box in and of itself and and uh in the beginning of him trying to get to this thing he's you know in body armor and all sorts of stuff trying to find his way to it they hold him down and they get these you know the old sort of square wood nails yeah yeah so they nail three of them in his Forehead. So he goes through the movie basically as sort of an alternate version of Pinhead with these three nails sticking out of his head um, uh, as he's looking for the box. So that was that was the version that got us the job. Uh, and then we wrote a completely different version, which I, which was actually pretty cool that I, I really liked. It, expensive. It was probably $40 million version of Hellraiser. Um, and then... Um, and then we wrote a, another version after that. Uh, and then ultimately we wrote a version of, about a high school wrestling team that I fucking hated. A high school wrestling yeah. team in, in a Hellraiser movie? That, that, yeah. 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 They end up uh, in their bus, goes off the road. I, anyways, I, I, it, it was fine. I think we did. It was just so not how the journey had started. Mm -hmm. and how it kept sort of devolving it was just sort of like oh man um why, why didn't either of those films come to fruition they had i think that is a movie that has been so overdeveloped at least by them for years there was a million different versions of that story and different versions people wanted to tell different you know and it was and they were all so disparate and different and they had already made, you know, like eight uh, or however many six director video sequels on top of the yeah. other sequels. So it had been mined. Uh, and because of that, I think it, there was a, uh, how do we find something new? How do we find something we want to make? How do we, you know, I think actually Gary Tunnicliffe's um hellraiser judgment is actually really fun uh, uh, yeah I, I like i like hellraiser judgment. really fun and, mm -hmm. and i love gary as the auditor i think he does I do a great too. job I, do um, too. I mean there are parts of it that just make me cringe <laughs> that are just uh, there's a lot of vomiting <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah that that part was i i'd not been like disgusted by a movie in a long time but when it came to the vomiting i was just like oh scrub yeah. oh but yeah but I, it's a it's a good movie it's a good it hellraiser is. movie you know, and and that's to Gary's credit. And uh, you know, uh, I totally wish we could have had a chance to make the Bill Fickner movie because we talked to Bill about doing it. He was in. He would have done it, and and making that sort of, um, and it wouldn't have been, you know, it wouldn't have been a fortune. It wouldn't have been a million dollars, but it would have, you know, it could have been five or six. And and um, I think it would have been a fun movie. Yeah. Uh, that that sort of Frank story. Yeah. Um, and and wouldn't have taken away from from Clive's movie, mm. right? It wouldn't have taken away from what what Mr. Barker had made, uh, which I think was also something we didn't want to do, right? We didn't want to. That movie is 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 in and of itself a a completely unique experience. And so you know we had come come into it saying we we would not remake that. That was not something we were interested in doing yeah. um but to play in that world in that sandbox where we're up for that um i absolutely love drive angry 
I love everything about that movie. I love the cast. I, 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 I love Nicolas Cage, but I know that you wrote that part with Tom Atkins in mind. We so did. watch, yeah. so watching Tom Atkins with the girl and him sh- with the two guns in that scene, I probably, my head would have exploded probably. Um, <laughs> you can do one of those deep fakes and put Tom's, Tom's head on. on there, you the next body. there you go. There you go. I, I just love everything about that movie. I think it's incredibly fun and it's a total shame that that movie wasn't a success at the box office. Um, um, I, I agree. <laughs> it, it, it at least looked like a, a hell of a lot of fun to make and with such a mm. fantastic cast. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It was, we, we were so lucky to have the cast. We did uh, you know, the, uh, millennium, uh, had some, uh, very specific rules about, about how they wanted the movie to be made. Um, uh, mostly mm-hmm. having to do with time and over time and things like that. And we, said okay we'll follow those to the letter and we did and uh, and then we you know uh made the movie you know they they um we wanted billy burke we wanted bill fickner and they let us have both those guys and uh um you know bill was uh, just uh he was the first person we met to play the accountant and a lot of different people wanted that part and um and uh i just kept pushing for bill and and then you know and at one point they talked about bill maybe playing billy's part and and, uh, and so when the offer came in he was just like well which part am i going to play and then he found out it was the count and he was thrilled and, and, I, I, and I love I, I love William Fickner too. Um, again, another inspired casting choice i think he's great in in everything he's one of those guys who's He's in so much and he's good in so much that I think he's oh. kind of become that like, you know, oh, that guy. I've seen him in. Uh, oh, he's, in... he's one of those. He's one of those bad guys. Yeah. But he, yeah. but and, I think he's he's better than just being one of those guys. He's he's, he's, oh, a, he's a really good actor. He's got so much range. He, and part of the performance of the account is he went and um, uh, so, so Cirque du Soleil a couple times beforehand. And I can't remember which Cirque du Soleil it was, but one of the clown characters had a very specific way of moving and he sort of adopted a version of that which for how the accountant has it moves and sort of arrives uh, um and you know moves his head and and uh uh you know yeah i yeah the accountant was very fun i would have made a whole movie just to, you know just about the account <laughs> um and nick was great you know we were through we were thrilled to get nick and, and he loved the project to you know mike deluca um and and uh uh millennium both had had worked with nick before and we're very excited to to bring this project to him and he was supposed to do a different thing for them and and turn that down to do this um and uh we were incredibly grateful for that um, um, and you know, and, and Amber was great. I mean, I think this is one of the oh, yeah. best performances. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, and and uh, I, I, I loved seeing Todd get his ass kicked, like you oh, know, yeah. she twice. Really in kicked movie. his ass. She really, she kicked, really his kicked his ass. She really did. Like she, like Todd was wounded, and he would, and he'll, you know, he'd show you his bruises. He said, <laughs> "Yes, those are in the shape of Amber's hands." But come on. You know, you gotta suffer for your art, pal. There you go. And, and then, and then, and then, getting getting killed by Fickner. I mean, oh, come on. Yeah, getting killed by Fickner and, and beat up by Nick. I mean, he really got picked down by everybody. <laughs> That's true. That's true. He got his yeah. ass kicked by everybody in that movie. Yeah, yeah, and, and you know, Nick kicking the shit out of him was great. Did you have any air conditioner fall on his head? Oh. oh. Um, and then, uh, and I think that would kill you. I don't think he would survive that. Um, looking at that air conditioner, and when we did that, I was like, "Oh no, you'd be dead." You'd yeah, be just dead. Um, yeah. But farmer, uh, yeah, farmer must have a thick skull, very thick skull. No, I believe that to be true. Yeah. Or there, there's a lot of water on the brain that kind of cushions it. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and we killed, we killed, we killed, killed Todd a few times. We killed him in Trek, and we killed him in. in he's. I love his. Todd's death in, in, in Valentine. Uh, yeah, the guys are a blood that comes out of the top of his head is is probably one of my favorite kills in all the movies that we've done. Yeah. Um, yeah. Todd is just so fun to beat up and kill. Yeah, it's just a thing. Just a thing. <laughs> um, my Bloody Valentine, of course, was a huge success. Um, and success has many fathers. 
Um, but when it comes to a movie like Drive Angry that wasn't so successful, um, mm. is the blame laid squarely at your feet as the director, or does it does it close doors? Does it? Oh does sure, it, yeah. Does it? Okay, sure. okay. Yeah. How do you yeah. how, how do yeah. you how do you deal with with a a movie that's not successful? try and keep moving forward i mean you 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 know you nobody tries to make a movie that won't be successful mm -hmm. and you don't go into it with that intent you you do the best you can with uh with what you have and 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 with every intention of, of making something that's uh going to make the people who pay for it money um, you know, and that was very much our intent and, and, uh, it didn't work out for a variety of reasons. I think, I think season of the witch coming out like five weeks before us or whatever was not helpful. Um, I think opening Oscar weekend was not helpful. I think the ad campaign, uh, revealing the big sort of reveal in the movie was not helpful. Like, you know, all sorts of things like that, but. You know, it is what it is. So at the end of the day, you're sort of left holding the bag, and and then you just try and move on to to find what the next thing is. I you know did a lot of writing in that period uh, afterwards, and uh, I worked on the uh, on the Terminator movie, um, uh, which uh, on Genesis, and 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 uh, um, and then wrote a sequel to that which ultimately wasn't made you know they made dark fate instead which i totally understood um given that they weren't as as uh happy with the with the domestic box office results the foreign box office results for for genesis were huge um but yeah you know sure drive angry um if it had come out and and, and made but valentine made i think that would have been a very different story um you know i think valentine it's funny the the success of Valentine. I often feel we were not credited with that. That was something that was uh, largely seen as a, a byproduct of the 3D and the genre, mm. uh, and not not the making of it. Um, um, you know, I think that was just a product of the time. You know, is what it is. Um, yeah. So sure, yes. Does it affect you? Absolutely. Um, do you yeah. move on? Sure. That's what else can you do? You gotta you know, just I've keep always, swimming forward. Yeah, I've always kind of been fascinated with how 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 does how the industry you know you can be the golden boy one second and then oh well he's you know it was a great movie but people didn't see it how how it how it's and, and how you know because somebody's got to be blamed um when something doesn't work right so I, I was always kind of fascinated with how sometimes the the industry people, people just keep getting promoted up <laughs> but yeah I was, i've always been kind of fascinated with um you know how the industry perceives uh, I, don't, I don't i don't know if that's the right word but you know if the movie doesn't perform who's to blame and if you're the one that's to blame then you know what's what what do they do, do they just pretend like you didn't you don't exist now or or yeah. what yeah they just they just make it harder for you to get work uh, mm -hmm. or they're and you know what it's not even that they just don't even think about you they're just looking for the next person mm -hmm. you're you're you've sort of you've sort of become a non-entity mm -hmm. um so you just try and keep doing what you can do to find your next gig and and mm -hmm. whatever that is you know we um todd and i did um, three drafts of a remake of um the sentinel over at, oh. uh, over at blumhouse um but ultimately it um and we had a building to shoot it in and uh that was going to be demolished um uh that we were going to shoot its demolition mm -hmm. uh it was owned by uh, one of the hospitals in 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 la and they were going to delay the demolition um, so we had it all sort of figured out. And then, um, one of the things that happened was that, um, the Sentinel was made, was there in development to be remade like 10 or 15 years before we went to do it, um, mm -hmm. at Universal, but a $40 million version, not a $2 million version. 
And because of that, a lot of the same people were still at Universal and they read the script and go, well, where's this? Where's that? Why is she a supermodel? Why is she in this? Why, why isn't this, would this happen? And they can't, and they, and they're like, because we're going to make a $2 million version. I think that's why, yeah. <laughs> that's why none of that stuff's there. Um, and, and it just became uh, too prolific. There was too, what they thought we, we were going to be able to remake pretty easily because it was from the Universal Library and they had their own with Universal proved that it was going to not be because of the baggage that was with the uh, was with the IP, so it wasn't going to be something we could do. So, um, but you know, years later, I did you know one of the Into the Darks for them, uh, which I was which I had a great experience doing the uh, uh, Flesh and Blood um, in the first season of Into the Dark uh, for Hulu with. Uh, uh, Dermot Moroni and Diana Silvers, which was really uh, Silver, it was a really fun movie to make. Hmm. Um, and uh, and then did an episode of The Purge for them, which was a great, you know, a total blast during that crazy show. Cool. Um, but yeah, um, yeah. Cool. Uh, we are running a little long, so I but I do want to ask you about Terminator Genesis, which you mentioned, and then I want to turn the floor over um, to uh, to the audience because we do have some questions from the viewers. Um, how did how did your involvement in Terminator Genesis come about? Uh, I was working with a co-writer in that uh, and had a. Uh, uh, project being written for Skydance, the uh, science fiction thing. And, and uh, as that was finishing up, uh, their offer came in to pitch um, uh, the, what was just Terminator 5 at the time. Um, and um, the pitch really revolved around two central points. One was the Arnold and Arnold fight, and the other was uh, uh, making John Connor the villain. Hmm. Um, and the story sort of extrapolated out of that. It, it, it was sort of like the, the, one of the way we talk about it was the gospel according to Kyle Reese. Hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, I was a huge fan of, uh, the original film and, uh, uh, Lita Kelegritis who, who, uh, I wrote the project with, uh, who also, uh, you know, had been involved in Avatar and stuff and, knew Cameron very well and got his blessing for what the idea that we were pitching and how we were going to go forward. And, um, so that's how that came about. You know, I think, uh, I think the marketing of that movie where they revealed the John Connor turn in the trailer was like probably fucking not, crazy. Probably not a smart move. I, I yeah, I, I, I it, you know, it's like, Mark and the Empire Strike Back strikes back with uh, "I'm your father." I'm your father, exactly. Yeah, that'd <laughs> yeah, be the yeah. tagline on the I'm poster. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. But uh, uh, guess but, who? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but a Terminator movie. I mean, that seems like a project. Oh my with, god! Of course, was, it was a dream project. I was thrilled to be part of it. I was. I felt so incredibly lucky and fortunate to be part of it. I, I loved working with Skydance. I thought they were all excellent to work with. I, I thought. Arnold was amazing um, and was a, like just a pro. Um, I loved the sort of symmetry of old, you know, old Arnold, you know, old, old, not old, uh, not obsolete. You know, that was, uh, um, I think in the days after Drive Angry, I began to feel that. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, trust but me, I'm not obsolete. There, yeah. there had to be, I mean, of course, enormous expectations and sure. were there a sure. lot of eyes on, on you during the routing process to make sure you weren't going to mess it up? A lot of notes, a lot of, you know, like, uh... yeah, there was all sorts of stuff. And and then I think, uh, you know, uh, it was because it was a big tentpole movie. So the, the, certainly the draft that we submitted in the summer of uh, 14, uh, I know uh, Adam Goodman, the head of the studio at the time, at Paramount at the time, uh, they were thrilled with it. Uh, I remember him saying, I don't totally understand this, but I think I think this is really exciting. Um, and, um, you know, it was probably overly complicated. It, it the, the drafts that we went into it with, you know, that the studio first read were, were I think, uh, simpler in how the information got parceled out. 
the, in that beginning, there was, a, there was a different way you got some of that information. And as those things began to condense, suddenly all the information was being dumped in sort of one scene, which I think, I think became problematic because it was like, uh, when, you know, we're not going to explain to you about time travel. Uh, you know, what our theory of it is, good luck understanding this mess. Um, uh, just because time travel is, it will rip your brain in half. Uh, doing a time travel story, you know, mm -hmm. it is it is a complicated loop de loop. Um, but you know, it was, I was incredibly grateful to be part of it. You know, the, the, I think I think there were all sorts of challenges at the movie at the time because of the other big movies that were being made at the time, um, uh, Hunger Games in particular. Um, uh, but I think the uh, you know there are some great sequences in that film, and I, yeah. I you know I think it got I think it got much more maligned than it deserved um, by some critics and things like that. But you know I think it's a fun experience, and I think there's you know some things in it as I said that I'm very proud of. Mm. I did like the um, how the Terminator had kind of. It was almost fatherly of yes, Sarah yes. at that point. Yeah, um, that that was that was. There was a sequence that that originally there was a sequence written that that you saw the whole sort of flashback of 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 the Terminator coming back and and saving Sarah as a child, and you know with that the idea of well you fail this time just send somebody further back, um, and and that. Sequence just became a story that she tells in dialogue, and you see a little piece of it. I always felt that we missed a major opportunity by not seeing that. And then, because there was a desire for, you know, really to have a sequel to it, originally this this there was a originally at the ending in the first draft we wrote the 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 time machine that that Cyberdyne is working on is actually functional. Um, and the movie is a race to stop the Terminator that kills her parents from doing it. And you see it go at the end. And then you, where Guardian comes from is the Terminator from the beginning that he kills in, in Griffith Park, rather than them melting it He's embedded in the foundation of Cyberdyne because Pop's guardian worked on the construction. And there's a joke that he says, I you know, worked on it and got laid off. Is he breaks the wall and he pulls it out. And he's the one who has reprogrammed it to save to send it back to save Sarah. Um, so that all that shit was it all made sense. <laughs> but you know. I totally understand. It's a big investment. You've got this IP for so long. You want to be able to to prolong it, and totally get why it went the way it did. Yeah, let's uh, let's see what's going on out in the audience. Um, shout out to Freezing Point Studios for the four ninety nine super chat. Thank you. He asks, and I think you've pretty much already answered this question. How was it editing Scream, and how long did it take you? I think we've we've pretty uh, much. Covered yeah, the screen was the, the the director's cut. As I say, a lot of director's cuts are are, are ten weeks. This director's cut, and that was only like four weeks. It was very quick to put together. Um, there was a few scenes that we cut out and a few scenes that we reshaped. All about trying to hide the killers. Everything mm -hmm. that we sort of did was trying to massage that so it became less obvious. There's the one scene in particular we cut out that where it was like, "Oh, Billy and Stu, it's them." Um, uh, so we had to get rid of that. Uh, thank you, Nico, for the $5 super chat. Uh, he's just not a question, just a statement. He says, my bloody Valentine 3d is an annual event. Thank you, Mr. Luz. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Lucier Piz. You're the best. Oh, well, thank you very much. That's very kind. Uh, and thank you. Get my buddy Gabe for the 49, 499 super chat. He says, was there ever a discussion of using the ballad of Harry Warden? In there the was. Valentine? Whoa. It was we. You know what we we um, approached uh, Jonathan Colton about singing it, about oh. doing a cover. He was touring at the time, and so we we talked to. I remember I talked to him on the phone and, and tried to get him to do it. And then Paramount 
who oh, they Paramount when they got the rights, they didn't get the rights for the song. And Paramount owned the rights for the song, and they oh. wanted like thirty five grand for the song. And the studio was like, oh, we don't want to pay the money for it. So yeah, no, we 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 were going to get Jonathan Colton to sing to sing oh. the ballad of Harry Ward. That was totally going to happen. That would have been. Uh, we sent great. it to him and everything, and he was he was totally up for it. But anyways, oh. it or it doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. But yes. That, yes. That would have been so fantastic. Not being able to do that. Yeah. Uh, um, Aiden Vavra would like to know: Did you have creative control over the Dracula sequels? Um, the creative control is always a relative term. Uh, we had more control because less money was being spent, but because less money was being spent, we had, uh, there was less we could do, mm -hmm. um, like the budget was infinitely smaller, um, on the two sequels. So, so, uh, I feel that they're, they're sort of movieettes. They're not quite the movies we had in mind. Um, but, uh, but they're close to, I, I think, uh. Yeah, and, and having Jason Scott Lee and Jason London and and uh, and the cast were great fun, and and, and obviously Wrecker and, and and Stephen Billington, we we loved having those guys as as our Draculas. And, and Roy Scheider. Oh, now, I've, I've been a huge fan of Mr. Scheider's forever, and and getting to work with him and uh, and uh, have dinner with him and talk to him about like all that jazz. You don't really talk to him about jazz, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but all that jazz you would wax poetic about. Yeah. Um, See, I was going to ask, I was going to ask, did you, um, did you, did you broach the subject not, of Jaws 2? Did not bring, did not bring up Jaws or Jaws 2, uh, uh, but, but certainly talked to uh, all that jazz and, and uh, 52 pickup and, and uh, you know, uh, other, uh, other great films of his career. French Connection. Oh yes. Of Sorcerer. Yeah. Oh yeah. Great stuff. Yeah. Seven ups. Um, mm -hmm. My buddy Joe Reese wants to know what was Kevin Williamson like to work with and be around. Uh, great, yeah. I, I thought I was like Kevin. Kevin was uh, was is uh, incredibly smart. Um, he was uh, really uh, good to work with. He had really good insight into obviously into the into the characters and he created them, but into how the characters were being portrayed and and, and unfolded and cut together. And, and uh, I always had really great advice um, about, uh, especially, uh, you know, because he, he didn't write Screen 3, he was busy on other things, but but he had great input, especially on the opening of that movie. The reason, you know, Cotton Weary has a go girlfriend and everything in the beginning, that you, you know, Christine, who you meet and everything like that, that's all Kevin. Kevin came up with that idea. Uh, you know his because originally the original version of that is just a dead girl that falls out of a closet and oh. you're just kind of like don't don't have him racing to save somebody who we don't meet and we don't care about um yeah. you know he's just real practical smart storyteller that's cool uh my buddy jeff overing uh wants to know uh to summarize his question basically have you been involved in um any of like the blu-ray releases of the, the nightmare on elm street have you done like a commentary or an interview for new nightmare or anything like that uh i just the uh, just the documentary uh never sleep again i uh, was okay. involved with that and talking about talking about the new nightmare section the one that heather line can't produce uh, my buddy Joe Cool says, "What authentic prop from the original Planet of the Apes movies do you wish you could own?" Oh wow, that's uh, I. I think you want one of those, you know, one of the like Doctor Zayas's costume, you know, that that orange sort of thing with the leather and that weird shoes and uh, or the scrolls or you know the statue of the lawgiver, or, uh -huh. you know. Uh, or the the thing where you you know that Charlton Heston falls on to to destroy the world at the end of the second movie, which is just like, who does that at the end of a sequel? Yeah, just blow up the planet. That'll be happy. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's a great. I, I remember seeing that ending as a kid for the first time and just being like, so bummed out. Like they they blew up the planet. How? What? Yeah. Well, and that and the line of dialogue of like a green and insignificant planet is now dead. Yeah. Whack. And the sound of wind, and it's just like, huh, it's yeah. a feel good movie of the summer, exactly. Yeah, 
Um, my buddy JS asks, um, basically how is the film, how's the film industry, um, changed from say even 10 to 20, how's it changed? Uh, let me just read his question. Uh, what is working in the film industry like today compared to 10 to 20 years ago? That's much easier. What's working today is and the, what wasn't working 10 to 20 years well, no, ago. What, what was, um, how's, how's the, how's the, how's, how's the industry changed? I, I, I think it's just, uh, it keeps changing with, uh, you know, it's a, it's a constant moving thing of, of the kind of things that are getting being made, how things are going to be made, you know, uh, what's getting made. Um, uh, you know, uh, movies now seem to be either, uh, under $5 million or over 150. Uh, mm. so you're either making a movie for nothing or you're, or you're making it for more money than cut. Uh, mm. so, um, you know, that's, those are challenges in, in and of an era. You know, you think about, uh, even my bloody Valentine or scream or those movies, those are all sort of mid range to low range movies, but a lot of that budget range isn't made anymore. So, you know, that's a, that's, I think, uh, an unfortunate thing. Cause I think there's lots of stories that would support that. Um, I certainly think, you know, with the switch to streaming and stuff like that, there's all sorts of different opportunities, uh, there, but I think, you know, again, everybody's still finding all the direction that said, there's a million fantastic series that are beautifully written and everything like that, that are, you know, exciting to be part of watch and see. Uh, my buddy, Eric Perry, he says, uh, where did the Judas storyline come from in Dracula 2000? Uh, we, we talked about that uh, a little earlier on. So, um, <laughs> if you want to, what's, what's yeah, the show? It, it, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll just tell you real quick that, uh, uh, it was Joel Sasson and I sitting there talking about what was Judas's last, you know, and what was G Dracula's last sunset If Dracula is afraid of the, afraid of the sun, afraid of silver, afraid of this, afraid of that. What, why, what would his last sunset be? What would the last sunset be, be that would be most significant? And then we thought, oh, the crucifixion. Oh, he's Judas. Oh yeah, that's good. Oh, and he is not afraid of them. He fucking hates them. He's just pissed off. Um, and then we're both fans of Jesus Christ Superstar. So um, that's, that's shamelessly where that came from. Well, before I let you go, um, do you have any, any advice for um, anyone thinking of getting into the industry? Uh, I'll give you advice my my dad gave me. If you know, if you want it bad enough, you know, you'll get it. You just have to want it bad enough. And and I think, you know, real practical advice: be kind, be grateful, and and say thank you to everybody. And um, and it's you know. Uh, you get in the film industry. Just remember, it's it's a, it's it's hard to get in, and, and everybody else is trying to get in. And just be nice to everybody you you meet and you find along the way, um, because it's a it's a great job to have. And and um, I think those are those are probably the most important. And tell tell you know whatever story you're telling, be it whatever it is, just fall in love with it. Don't hesitate to to give every part of yourself to it and tell the best story you can. Very, very wise words. I know we've all had a lot of downtime um, because of the <laughs> pandemic. Uh, I'm sure I'm sure you've been working on a lot of projects. Anything that you feel free you 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 want to talk about that you've gotten uh, you're hey. working on. Uh, nothing I really want to talk about yet. You know, there's a few things, uh, that we're circling and, and coming around that we're, you know, trying to see if we can get some, some cast interested and stuff like that. Uh, Todd and I have something that we've written together that we're still out flogging. And then I have a couple other things that I'm, I'm working on. And it's something that, uh, uh, Matt Bain, the writer of, uh, White Noise 2, uh, who's written a bunch of other things that, uh, that it's really fun that we're trying to get going over at Dark Castle. And, you know, we're just... You just keep swinging and trying to get things to land. A lot of it is just trying to get everything to line, line up. So you yeah. don't want to jinx it. Today. It's still saying too much ahead of time. Well, that's great, man. Uh, hopefully we'll see a lot more, uh, a lot more from the Lucier farmer connection in the future. <laughs> sure. 
That would be and, great. And I, I certainly wish you the best of luck. I know everybody watching uh, wishes you guys the best of luck also. Uh, cool. And, and hopefully I, I, I think we're kind of sort of getting close to getting back to some sort of normalcy and hopefully uh, everybody will be back. Whatever working. that is. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you very much, Justin. This is been very fun. And thank you yeah. to, to all your viewers. Yeah, I, I can't thank you enough. We've gone for almost three hours. I don't I don't know where the time Yikes. went. Yikes. <laughs> but um you've I don't been, know, but it's dark now. It wasn't when we started. <laughs> <laughs> you've been incredibly candid. You've been a great guest. So many awesome stories. Thank you so much for your time. I can't uh, I can't thank you enough. It's been great. Well, thank you. It's been my pleasure. It's oh. been a thrill to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much. And a huge thanks to everybody who tuned in. We've had a pretty lively chat tonight. Um, I guess everybody's shy. They don't want to jump in and, and say hello or ask a question. That's fine. Um, but um, let me give some shout outs here to uh, let's see. Todd is still in the chat. Todd, thank you for tuning in. I'm sure you kept everybody yes, thank up. You, thing. Yes. <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Boone. Thank you, Scary Jerry. Thank you, Jeff Overing. Thank you, Joey, JS, Joe Cool, the Tully Espo, uh, Ring Hitch, Eric Perry, J uh, da -da 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 -da. Aiden Vavra, Gabe, uh, Jess Graham, Aiden. Thank you all for tuning in. There's Toronto Freddy. How you doing, buddy? Wise Guy 100. Thank you for tuning in. Entertainment Wizard. Thank you. Uh, yeah, this has been an absolute blast. Again, thank you so much, Mr. Lucier. Have a uh, great rest of your night and uh, all the best in the future, sir. Thank you. Have a great one. Again, thanks to everybody for tuning in. Um, have a great rest of your night. Take care. Stay safe. And until next time, peace. I think they're coming to get you, Patrick. Run. Run. Yeah. <laughs> See you, man. Take care. See you guys. Bye-bye. See ya. I can't find my outro. There we go. See ya.